You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Started walking and then I just heard behind me and I didn't even get to turn around and he grabbed me around the throat and pulled me to the floor and ejaculated all over me. And I was just like, is that actually, I couldn't even believe it. Like, is that real? We're walking along and he just literally grabs me. He's got my hair and he pulls me down this alleyway and I thought, oh, here we go. So he doesn't want to rob me and he's telling me what he wants and I'm like, I can't have sex with you. I was like, my man will kill you and I'll tell him and he will kill you. And he was like, no. He said, like, I don't want, I don't want that. I mean, you can just suck me off. Um, and let's be honest, paedophiles are the worst people on the planet, aren't they? Yeah, I agree. It's disgusting. He came over, he's a very big gentleman and he was like, hello. I said, hello. And he went, I said, what do you want? And he went, dry anal. When I was there for two weeks, I couldn't believe how many men in white vans, like wolf whistle, all your way out the window, and the girls are in school uniform. I was like, that's bad, that. So it was actually a, the unit, the pedophile unit, um, were talking to this guy online, but they were getting suspicious, he was on Skype, but he was getting suspicious that um, he was a copper. And he said he wanted a call, a video call on Skype. Um, so they called me in and said, you need to speak to him. I had to read the transcript so I knew what the conversation had been and speak to him. And the conversation had been horrific, like it was disgusting. The dad had killed the mum, hung himself and left the baby, the baby starved to death. That was not the best scene though. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Danny Brook. How are you, Danny? I'm good, thank you. Thanks good. for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. You've just released your new book, which we'll plug straight away. The Girl for the Job, Undercover yep. Copper. You went quite dark, prostitution, escorting, catching nonsense, like that stuff. But fair play for you to doing it. No, I'd imagine a lot of people wouldn't step forward to do those sort of jobs, but it takes some guts, so fair play. Where can people buy the book, first of all? I think everywhere's got it, actually. I, I know a lot of people have got it on Amazon, but I know Wardstones have got it, all bookshops have got it, a little independent one in Chingford where I used to live has got it. So I, I think everywhere. I think in America it's not out until later in the year, but I've been sending copies over to North America because they're like, can we have it? Can we have it? So I've been just posting it for them. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. I don't know why they put my face on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's bold as well though because I've had a few undercover coppers on and they've wanted yeah. their face cut out and stuff and I, thought, I do Man. understand that but I just think if you've if you've done it and you're talking about it you've just got to do that either do it or not do it yeah, like, go all, all, ho yeah, yeah. all hog but um, yeah when the publisher sent me the picture I just laughed I said I look such, such a moody cow in that and I'm actually not like that at all I'm actually quite nice but <laughs> I look like a right yeah. So and so, yeah. Before we get into all the nitty gritty, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, mm -hmm. but get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Uh, so I was born in Mile End, so I'm a real Cockney, which, as you probably tell from my accent. Um, and then my parents, this was a bit of a funny one. My mum's from a massive family. She's the youngest girl, and they're from Sicilian heritage. So you can imagine they've got their own world of dealing with things. They don't need mm. the police, they police themselves. My dad was a copper. And my mum and dad met when he was on the beat and I was born eight months later. I was, yeah, I was little. It wasn't supposed to happen, obviously. They got married and then she had me earlier than she should have. She hadn't told her family. Oh, it was a bit of a mess. And of course, they, um, that marriage didn't last very long. And um, they got divorced and then we moved from Mile End. We actually moved to Plasto and then we moved from Plasto to Dagenham which was not very nice. Uh, so I grew up in Dagenham with my mum. I saw my dad and stuff at weekends, but um, I grew up predominantly with my mum and my stepdad. I uh, went to school in Dagenham, which if you know, Dagenham is not the nicest place on the planet. Um, and that was it. I was average at school. Like I wasn't the cleverest. I wasn't the smart, like, you know, the silliest, just average. Um, I've got a couple of siblings, but wasn't very close with them. I'm actually only really, really close to my sister now. She's had a baby. Like, we're re this baby's changed all of our lives. We're really tight now because he's just the best thing ever. Um, uh, yeah, and then when I was 15, I was at a party, uh, got attacked by some guys who thought it was a great idea to... They hit my, my boyfriend at the time over the back of the head with a bottle. 
I knocked him out uh, and then used the broken bottle to slash my friend's throat. Um, he didn't die, thank thankfully. Um, and then I don't remember any more than that. I witnessed all of that, but don't remember any more than that. And then woke up in hospital and they'd broken my cheek, my nose, I had jaw damage, broken ribs. But it was the wrong place at the wrong time. It wasn't me. It was just, I was just there. It would have been anyone. Um, and that was my first encounter really with the police, even though my dad was a cop. I didn't, I'm not going to join the police because my dad said, no, that's not cool, is it? Uh, where I lived, no one thought the old bill were cool. Like it was not, they weren't not cool. We all had respect, but we'd never want to be a copper. Um, and that was the first encounter I had with the police. So I thought, they, I thought they were really good. Like they were really kind to me, like really, really nice. Um, and I didn't think at the time, oh, I want to be a police officer, but obviously something subconsciously, I was happy that, with what they were doing. Um, went to Crown Court with the suspects and then they went away. I carried on at school, did my A-levels. And my dad said, there's a police recruitment drive for police, uh, a female police recruitment drive. I think you should apply. I was like, don't think so. I'm going to be a lawyer. And he was like, no, you're not. I think you should apply. And I applied and then that was it. Before you know you're a copper. I'm a copper and I didn't even plan it. But you'll see that throughout my whole life. I don't plan anything. It just happens. Mm. Yeah. How were you treated with your dad being a copper back in the day as well? Like obviously copper. Nowadays people understand and I get a better understanding of the police force now that I actually speak to them, the trauma, the pain, the misery that they go through, the, yeah. the doors they have to go through to help save children and and, and basically, listen, there's bad and good everywhere in the world. We get it. There's corrupt coppers everywhere. There's corrupt people everywhere in life. We get, we know. Yeah. But the misery and the torment that a copper has, has to go through is unreal. And I understand it more what they have to go through on a daily basis. The things they have to see, the dead bodies, kids dying, kids getting raped. That's some dark, dark stuff. Yeah. So I take my hat off to anybody that actually wants to do that now. Yeah. If you're good and you want to genuinely want to help people and clean up the streets, I'm all for it and I'll back you a million percent. How were you treated with your dad being a copper then? Was it okay being a girl and your dad a copper? Did you get a lot of stick? Not in, do you know, it wasn't in um, secondary school. It was in primary school. I remember being in like juniors and I remember being quite happy that my dad, I thought it was really cool um, because I was little. Not when I got to secondary school, I just didn't tell anyone. But when I was at primary school, I remember saying my dad was a policeman and I remember them like, like snorting like a pig at me and calling me piglet. But I didn't, I wasn't offended. I used to just think, it was boys as well. So I just feel like whatever idiot <laughs> like I didn't yeah. I wasn't bothered but yeah I, I remember being called piglet and I just thought you're just an idiot mm -hmm. um but I never told anyone at secondary school there's no need is there <laughs> so I don't think it would have gone down, down well in high school how did your dad handle it when you got attacked my dad's the calmest man on the planet um it was my mum that nearly got nicked so when we got all taken to hospital they turned up the suspects turned up at the hospital which is ridiculous why I was just kicking off. There was, it, honestly, it was completely unprovoked. It wasn't just us three either. There was more people that got attacked. Um, they were all drunk, drugs, and they just went kicking off with everyone in the street. Um, but my dad's calm. So he was like, he because he's a big job, he could just process it and handle it properly. And I remember he said to me, Dan, um, they need to take the clothes off. And I know you're not going to like them doing that. And I said, oh, like, why? He said, because there's a lot of blood and they don't know where it's coming from. They think you, like you could have been stabbed. I was like, I don't think I have. He was just like, yeah, but they need to take your clothes off down. And I was like, oh, all right. But my mum was like a banshee going nuts, like kicking. She was like chasing the guys around the hospital. And the copper said to my mum, like, you're going to get nicked if you carry on. She was like, I'm not having this. Um, yeah, she's, she's from East London. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, she turned proper East. Um, but yeah, my dad's fine. He's, he's just, he's so, he's the one I go to for advice because I know he'll think about it and not just shoot from the hip and he'll just... Be yeah, calm, be relaxed. It. Yeah. What about the family fallout? How did everybody end up falling out, brothers and sisters? Is that because of the divorce? A lot more to mm, that? I don't think there was any reason. My mum and dad had me and they had my brother, but my brother's a mummy's boy <laughs> and I'm a daddy's girl. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so me and him just, and we're really different, like so, so different. People went at school, the teachers would say, Brooke, is your brother Mark? And I'd go, yeah, and they'd go, wow. We would never have guessed that. Like, nobody would believe we were siblings, ever. Were you a wee tomboy? No. And everybody says this as well. I'm the girliest blow dryers, nails, like, ever. Um, but I do like football and I do like a beer. So, um, <laughs> and that's what my husband says. He's like, you're the girliest boy I know. Like, you're amazing. <laughs> um, but and my sisters, my sister, half-sister. So my mum and my stepdad had my sister. And then my dad and my stepmom had 
another girl sister. Mm -hmm. Me and her are actually quite close and everyone always says, oh God, you two are like two peas in a pod, just so similar, you look alike. But we didn't live together growing up. So I only saw her weekends or school holidays and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but since my other sister with my mum's side has had a little boy, he's just brought all the family together. It's madness because I'm quite independent. My mum will try and ring me and I'll just WhatsApp her and it drives her mad because I don't want a phone call. I'm like, mum, I don't want to talk on the phone. I'll just WhatsApp you. I'm fine. I'm alive. Don't worry about it. Um, whereas my mum and my sister speak every day, all day on the phone. But my dad's like that. He doesn't ring his family either. He's a texter. He'll just say, are you okay? I'll say, yeah, that's it. So you see a lot of yourself and your dad then? I think so. I, I always looked up to my dad, like really, I thought he was so cool. Like he had a nice house, nice car. My stepmom's really nice and always been so kind to us. Um, yeah, my dad, I really think my dad's really cool. All my mates used to fancy him, which was weird though. <laughs> <laughs> they all say he looks like Jeremy Kyle and it really upsets him. <laughs> <laughs> so see, what's the process for a, a woman to get into the police force? I've had a lot of men on that, Different, yeah. Back in the day, it was different heights, different weights, all that. Everything's changed now. But what's the process for a female? When I joined, they were looking for females. So I think it's probably a little... I hate to think I got the job because I'm a woman, but let's be honest. <laughs> Did your dad help? Uh, with the application process, yeah. yeah. But then when you go there, you still have interviews. You still have to do all the tests. And then they tell you if you, if you have to pass that bit, then you can go and study at Hendon for, I think it's 18 weeks we did it. Um I didn't know how I got through that because I was sat in a room as an 18 year old thinking I didn't have much life experience, but actually everyone else in the room had come from like little villages and places out of London. So I suppose growing up in London and Essex, you have, you, you live more than you would normally live and see things that you don't normally see. Um, and women were like getting turned away that day. And I'd been told I'd passed and I was like, that's a bit weird that. And my dad was like, just take it. Don't worry about it. I said, I think they've made a mistake. And he was like, just stop it. Just go. And then um, they said, it's an 18-month waiting list before you can go to Hendon. And I said, yeah, whatever. Like, That's fine. And then on the following Sunday, I got a phone call from them saying, um, someone hasn't turned up. Can you take their place and come tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, I'll come. But I had no, none of the kit. I didn't have any, any of, like, there's like a long list of equipment you need. I had none of it. And I just went and the, the staff there are police officers. They're the trainers. And they were like, where's your this? And I go, oh, but I only got the call yesterday. And they were like, they didn't care. They were like, it's not my problem. And I was like, oh. And so quickly I learned that there's no excuse. You've just got to like say sorry and remedy it quick. Um, but I thought that was a reasonable answer. <laughs> like, well, I only found out yesterday. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I remember his name, Star Flyset. And he was like, do you know someone that loves you but hates you? He was one of them. Like, he really hates, there's me and my two best, we're still best mates now. We were in the same class at Hendon. And he hated us, but secretly loved us. Like, We'd see him, like, we'd, we'd laugh at something he'd say and then he'd turn around with a little smirk that he would try and be angry, but you knew he secretly liked mm -hmm. it. But at the time, we were scared of him, but, like, now I think about it and I'm like, we actually had him wrapped around our little finger. <laughs> yeah. What was your first day in the beat like? I, didn't, I thought it was a bit boring the first day because when you get that, like, onto your borough, so from after Hendon, you then get to pick your borough. And I went to Town Hamlets, which is where I'm from. Um, so I know it's lively and I wanted to just get out and, like, and I remember just this process. They're like, let's go and walk around and stop some cars. And I'm like, I don't want to stop cars. I want to like be in the car running around, like nicking people and like, attending like calls from a, an emergency you know, like, call. Um, and that did happen, but it takes, I didn't realise, I was just impatient. It takes a good Dang. number of weeks mm -hmm. before they let you do any of the cool stuff. See, when, why did you pick your, the, your own borough though? Was that not be more dangerous because people knew you or would it be better because people knew you? I pick, I think I only picked it because I knew how it's such a good borough that like you've got extreme wealth and extreme poverty, like literally side to side. Mm -hmm. So I knew it'd be busy and it would be a lot. I knew I'd, I'd learn a lot. Um, and I just thought, why not tell Hamlet? So I still have family that live there, but they're older, so they wouldn't give me grief. All my cousins are out of, out of there now, so that's fine. Did you ever knock anybody you knew? No, but I did see people... Oh, this is so sad. My favourite, I can't say favourite uncle, but he's my favourite uncle. He's no longer with us, but he used to have a shop in Bethnal Green. And uh, my colleague who was at Hendon with me, she said, oh, I've got to tell you something. I was like, I was getting changed. I said, well, what's happened? She went, I think I nicked your uncle today. <laughs> and I said, what's Uncle Stephen? And she went, yeah. I said, why? She said, because I'd stopped the van and he wasn't named on the, the, 
the document he had. And I was just like, is his van, is his shop? And she was like, yeah, I, she, I did let him go after, like I de-arrested him, but I did arrest him. I said, did you cuff him? She said, yeah. I was like, oh. and he's like the nice, like he's the one that I would never be worried about getting arrested. Yeah. But yeah, she arrested my, my good friend, arrested my uncle. Um, yeah. Madness. I was like, I feel so bad for him because he's mm -hmm. so nice. It's funny, man, like, I always grew up with coppers and that in the house and coming in and come through the doors, family members, myself. I always had the vibe, even if you were getting surveillance and that, you know? Yeah. I don't get that feeling with you. I've been a copper. Yeah. That bubbly, good energy, kind of wee bit hyper, that like just, you never see that. Quite Majority coppers are quite door-faced. Yeah. Are quite serious and right, 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 rightly so with all the shit they see. Did you think you get away with an extra wee bit more because you had that personality? 100%. Yeah, the female thing, and with the deployments I did, it that, it would needed to be a female anyway. Like a, a man just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And similarly, there were jobs that were set for men that I just wouldn't be good for. Um, but and it sounds really bad saying this, but men are. I was I was a lot younger then, and I did weigh about three stone less than I weigh now. But you know, a touch of the arm and a little giggle at their lame. Joe, it doesn't draw them. You're, you're fine, like, and, and a lot of the time they would just think I was too stupid. That mm. it wouldn't enter their brain because I'd be like, "She's just too stupid to be old Bill." Yeah. Um, but it's, it, a, it's a good card to play, and yeah. it? it's a good one to have to make everybody feel at ease. And that's when people's guards come down. <laughs> yeah, that's why true. I'm so good at my job. <laughs> yes. It's a bit of bullshit in there, isn't it? It's just full of shit, isn't it? Yeah. So, what was your first arrest like? Were you nervous or were you buzzing? How does it work? Um, the first one, it was rubbish. It was for theft of a car stereo. Yeah, petty airplane. stuff. Yeah, it was really... But at the time, obviously, I was really happy. I just really wanted to be... I yeah. wanted to go, like... And that was what I was there to do. I wanted to get bad people off the streets. This guy, he was bad, actually. And he's he was the bane of my policing career at Tower Hamlets. Our paths crossed quite a lot. Um, and he was not a nice person. But it was a car radio, Nick, and I wanted... I thought I was always going to get something a little bit better than that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I was nervous. And I remember you have like a tutor with you and he was such a lovely man. And I'd be going, am I doing this one? He'd be like, yeah, you're fine. And I'd be like, what about that? What do I need to do now? And I, I'm just like asking him all these questions, probably driving him mad. Um, but it was just a nick for a car stereo. Like if mm -hmm. you go to Brick Lane, there's hundreds of car stereos. Well, not now probably, but there was then. Mm -hmm. And bikes, like it's probably a bit of an easy... An easy one. Do you phone your dad and say, Dad, I've just got my first arrest? Or was it just a case of on to the next one? No, I didn't ring him, actually. But I, I did obviously tell him, but this, oh, God, I sound so old. But do you know, like, then as well, phones weren't, like, you know, like, we all live on our phone now. Yeah. I did, I probably didn't even pick it up for the day. Like, you know, and it's, you just, I think I just got a camera phone. So it was a long time ago. But So what's the process then from you to do, doing on the beat to then going undercover? Like, how long did you have to do you're supposed to do a minimum of two years before you can apply to do the covert work. But um, I fell into that as well. Um, I, my governor was a really good friend of my dad's. Really nice guy. He um, He's actually does body recovery now. In, he's left the police and he's got a, co a company that teaches body recovery in disasters. He's an incredible man. Like one of the best policemen I've ever met. Um, and he said to me, tomorrow night, We'd finished a uh, uh, late turn, so two till ten, and he's tomorrow, Dan, it's night duty. Can you come in in civvies and your plain clothes? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll come in. What, what are we doing? <laughs> I, was like, I don't know what's going on. And he said, you and your colleague are going to go out in, I think he didn't say colleague, he said his name, um, patrolling plain clothes. And I was like, oh, all right. And I thought, this is it. Like, this is me. I'm, I'm undercover. And I had no clue that there was a unit that was undercover. And this is just plain clothes I had no idea that there was a difference um so that night me and my colleague went out we were living the dream thought we were like Cagney and Lacey in this car um but what we I didn't realize because I was young in service I, I really didn't really fully still understand that the criminals are really sophisticated and they know what they're doing and they obviously saw us before we saw them and they knew every single car re uh, registration plate of all the cars, the marked, the unmarked, they knew everything. So if they saw our car, and they had watchers and... So our our success wasn't great when we was in the car. And I said to him, why don't we walk? And he was like, what? Like, coppers don't know coppers want to walk. And I was like, let's walk. And he was like, 
I don't think so. I was like, come on. I said, look, if it's rubbish, we just get back in the car. And he went, oh, all right. So we got out and we were walking around this estate. And obviously we know, we know where they're dealing, but we can't get close enough. But now we're in plain clothes and we're walking on nights. That's not expected. We walked into the stairwell and we nicked someone for possession with intent to supply. He was serving up. And um, I, was, I was a little bit excited because the evidence was there. There's like, that's, it's just what it is. Um, he had loads on him as well still. He'd only obviously just started his shift. Um, and I thought we'd done a really good job. The governor was happy. Our arrest figures were going like really high because we were getting up close and personal with people. Um, and then we did that for a little while, only on night duties though. There was no, like days are just too busy. Like you can't justify that. Um, but it obviously got attention from, the, we call them the senior management. Mm -hmm. Questionable <laughs> at the moment. Um, and I got a phone, another phone call saying, don't come in tomorrow, from the same governor saying, don't come in tomorrow. You need to go up to the yard. You've got a meeting at this floor, this time, wear a suit. And I thought, oh, I'm getting sacked. <laughs> I thought I'd push my luck. Because we were, we were, we were nicking people, not nick random, but like yeah. really the evidence was so good because we were up close to them. They were just banged to rights. Like it was unbelievable. Um, and I thought, yeah, I've pushed my luck. I'm out. And I kept saying to him, what for? He was like, just go. He said, if I tell you it's obvious, I've told you, just go. And I was like, okay. Got to the yard, and I'd been to the yard for briefings, but when I got to this floor, it weren't what I'd seen before. There was no open plan office. And I knocked on, and this, this lovely man came out, and he was like, I won't do my, my Scottish accent because it's pretty bad. <laughs> but he said, Ah, oh, Danny. And I was like, Hello. <laughs> he said, Come in. And I went in, and he was like, um, Do you know why you're here? I was like, I don't know. And I remember at this, my neck, it was a next suit. It was awful, but. All coppers have a next suit. And um, I was all sweating because I was nervous. And he said, um, you, we want to talk to you about doing the covert calls. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do it. But I still had no idea. And I didn't know there was different levels. So I started at the bottom level and then there's one more above it, um, which don't happen very often. So he said, like, you might as well just jump on this course. Um, we'd love you to do it. So I said, yes left, rung my dad. I did ring my dad then. I said, I've just been asked this, dad. And he was like, you're joking. I was like, serious? And he was like, you need to do it. He said, but you do know if you fail, that's it. Like if you fail that course, that's you. You can't do it again. Why? It's because you'd know what you to expect so you could plan for it. So they can judge you straight away if you're ready for it or not? Yeah, it was, honestly, it was hardcore. It was mental. I've The paranoia on that course. I was like a psycho. I was just like, they're watching me, like, I mean, what, I don't want to, I don't know where to look, I don't know what, what how to see it, because they're watching everything you're doing. And I, I realised quite quickly, this was not a normal course of nine to five or eight to four. This is a 24 hour course where you're being assessed for 24 hours a day. Um, and I'll sleep with the light on, because I thought, what if they're watching through the window to see mm. when we switch our lights off? So I, I slept with the light on because I didn't want them to think I was weak, which is ridiculous. Like I taught on the course after and I know, that's not what happens. But at the time, I was like this scared little, I don't even know what. But um, So what, you're in a house? How do, so what's the process? What Can you talk about the course? I can talk about some of it, but only what's Googleable. Okay. Um, so you're there for, you're at a site for a period of time. Um, it's probably not the same now. It's probably changed completely. Um, but you do, it's residential. You do stay there. And there's lots of role playing, like lots and lots and lots of Acting. horrible situations. Um bit of alcohol, <laughs> um, uh, loads of chats, friendly chats that are not friendly. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember there was one person, they, they go around and have a, there was 11 of us at start. They go around and I know where you they've done loads of work on you as well. They know everything about you. And this is before the days of open source really, because no one had social media. I think some people probably had Facebook or MySpace, but there was no social media. Um, and they ask you what drugs you've done and Everyone's like going, I've done this. I've done thinking, you are a nutter. Shut up. You're going to get kicked off. Like, Shut up. But there was one and she just went for it. And she was like, I've done that. And I've done, I was thinking, oh, never saw her again. But she, she just disappeared after that. We didn't see her again. But yeah, and they were saying to me, but you, you live near Romford. Like you must have been out all the time. Go down Faces. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I go to Faces, which is true. I did go to Faces, but I always drove because I didn't really drink. 
never done any drugs in my life. I bought plenty, but I've never done a single drug in my life because I would definitely die. And they were like, I don't think so. And I was like, I have no, I'm not lying. I just genuinely haven't done any drugs and I, I always drive everywhere. And they were like, mm, bet you're a bit of a slag though. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not. And they were like, but you're from Romford. And I'm like, well, not everyone from Romford's a slag. <laughs> and they were like, you probably are though. And I was like, I'm not. Like, what? Um, yeah, and it's just intense. And there was one, actually, there was one scenario, this is really bad. I was talking to someone about this the other day and it made them laugh. There was a scenario where, so when you are deployed for real, mm -hmm. you are given a set of instructions from a senior officer. And it's basically your do's and don'ts. Like, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. And it's an ask of covering exercise for them. And they sign it to say they've read it to you. You sign it to say you understand what they've um, said to you. So on this particular role play, they got this guy in and they told me he was from the Portuguese police and he was here to see how we teach covert ops training in the UK. I had no reason to disbelieve them. So he was acting as my SIO and he was a good looking man, very handsome. And I don't forget, I've been on this course for a long time. I've not showered the whole time. I've not cleaned my teeth for the whole time. I look like an absolute mess and I stink. So, do you know, like in Big Brother, when you go, oh, God, would she really fancy him or would he really fancy her? It was a bit like that. I'm in this bubble and I'm thinking, he's a 10, like he is a for proper sort. And so I'm not listening to him. I'm just looking at him. So we've both signed our document and off I've gone, done my role play. And then there's an a exercise where you're in court. And the, my colleague went up and gave her evidence in this role play. And then... It was my turn, but as soon as, as soon as I got in that box, I knew I'd written the wrong date, and it was obviously a test. And I was like, oh, shit, I've written the wrong date. I'd put the wrong day. I'd put today's date, but obviously it was meant to be yesterday. So I just I just owned it and said, look, I've written the wrong date. I'm human. Every, everything else in my statement is correct, but I have written the wrong date. And they tried to give me a bit of a hard time over it. I said, I'm not lying. I would, I'm not blaming anyone else. This is on my shoulders. This is me. I've made an error. Um, and then the guy said to me, the copper said to me, why do you think that you wrote the wrong date? And I couldn't say because I was like eyeballing baby boy from Portugal. And I was like, oh, well, I think I've just been very busy. I'm not too sure. And it's not because I'm stressed and this geezer's walked in. Um, and he went, do you think it's because you were staring at so-and-so, whatever his name was? I said, absolutely not. I said, oh, right. We well, hate to disappoint you, but he's not from Portugal. He's from Haringey. And he came in and he was like from Haringey. And he was like, all right. And I was like, oh, shut up. He was a police officer. And he was just there to like to get me. And I was like, that's really out of order. Funny. Because I did fall for it. That's how dark it goes. But I did fall for yeah. it. Yeah. I totally fell for it. I, but look, it's funny now, but I was, mm -hmm. I was so annoyed with myself after. And I thought, that's me out. I'm out. But I did, I wasn't. Because I they said I owned they I, I pulled it back because I took it on my own shoulders and didn't try and blame anyone else and mm. just said, it's me. See, when you're doing that sort of course, then if you get body language experts and stuff in place as well, looking at you, how you handle situations, like yeah. if movement, everything's little ticks. Um, do you have people in that course as well, looking at every scenario? Not everyone, but there were people that were doing it. But then the, the cops that are a lot of their uh, work is to check that as well so some of them you did like the final exercises there was people there just to make sure you wasn't giving like too much away um, and I talk as you say with my hands all the time which is mm. probably not a good thing um, but yeah the whole time you're just being assessed the whole time it's what about the no shivering and brushing your teeth well, like, why is that a lot of the scenarios are like crack heroin Mm. So if I pot, pot, and don't get me wrong, it's only now I've done this work. I understand there are functioning heroin users that you would never know. There are functioning crack users who are smart working in a city, particularly crack. Um, but obviously that doesn't fit the narrative of what people think. And mm -hmm. the, the police don't generally go for them people. They're going for the street, don't they? Yeah, it's easier targets, isn't it? Yeah. We can. Yeah. So when you pass the course, what are you thinking then? I didn't really get it still. <laughs> I was still thinking, oh, they won't ring me to do it because I still had my day job. Um, but then I realised quite quickly that day job, I didn't do it very often. It was so rare. Um, I, I did want my first deployment though. 
because the guys that were teaching me were so cool. They were proper, well, I thought they were really cool at the time. I was like, I want to be like them. And there was one lady and she was much older and she's like, she's no longer with us, but she was like a legend in that world. And I thought, yeah, like I want to be part of their crew because they were cool. And when they're telling you their stories that they've done, like their ops, mm -hmm. you're like, it's what? It's <laughs> like that doesn't happen. So I did want my first job, but I didn't really think it was going to happen. Um, and then I got my first job literally very, very quickly. <laughs> my job was doubt yourself. I just don't, I don't doubt myself. I just think like, that's why would that happen to me? Like, I'm not, I don't actively seek it. Like if I, if I want something, I will give it like a thousand percent and I will like pull myself to it. But I was back then I was quite like, oh, whatever. I was quite laid back and easy going with stuff. Mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, like now I overthink everything. I worry about everything, but then I didn't. I was just kind of like, mm, I, they won't ring, so it's fine. Whatever. But they did, <laughs> and it was quite quick. And did your dad ever support it, or kind of say maybe stay away from it because it is a dark field? That yeah, like, was he supportive of? I'd imagine he'd be supportive of anything you'd done, but did he support that decision to go undercover? Yeah, he thought it was really cool. Did he? Yeah, <laughs> he was like, "This is pretty big. This is a big deal." More money? No. Nope. Why not? They just don't. If it's overtime, it's more money. Um, but no. You get payments for little things here and there. So we're, the course up from mine, which I planned to do, I didn't end up doing, um, they get a little bit more, but like not, it's really not going to change your life in any way whatsoever. Mm. Um, but now it's just a part of your... It is a certain type of person that does it. Like when I look back and I think back to the people in my team, they were not, Regular cops. Yeah. What, what makes a good undercover cop? Confidence. Um, being able to think quickly on your feet. Just being able to adapt into the, any scenario as well, because it's, obviously you go there with an, an idea of what's going to happen. It never happens how you think. So you need to be uh, like adaptable quite quickly. Um, and just not not then overthink things. Um, but obviously I do that now instead. I've, I've, I've saved it all up and I just use it all now. <laughs> That's a mother's instincts, no, isn't it? Once oh, start having... I drive myself mad. Yeah. <laughs> so what was your first job like when you eventually got it? What were you thinking? I should have left. I should have left the police at that point. Why? Um, my first job was a disaster. <laughs> um, oh, it's so embarrassed. I was embarrassed, but I talk about it. Obviously, I was in the book. So um, all they said to me was, can you go out in Tot Tottenham and establish the supply of Class A? That was the intelligence. There was no, and I thought that was normal. I didn't understand that in a job, actually, they might have a phone number, an informant might have told the police something they can act on. I didn't realise that actually just going out to establish it, that's not normal. And actually, the unit probably wouldn't have allowed that job to run if they knew that was it. Um, and I remember just sitting at a bus stop thinking, well, of course there's Class A, we're in Tottenham. But I don't know where to go. I've never bought drugs in my life. I don't know what I'm doing. I was just sat at this bus stop like, don't know what I'm doing. Um, and there was a bookies and I just thought, oh, I'll go in there. I went in and obviously they're not the nicest of places. I'm just sitting there for a little bit and I, there was a geezer in the corner and I thought, yeah, he's definitely a user, which sounds awful now. Like my whole life, I should say, my whole life, I thought, if you do drugs, you know it's wrong, you shouldn't do it and you get caught, that's on you. But actually my opinions have changed drastically since leaving the police. Um, but at that time, I thought, you. So... I need to nut into him. I need to get into him. I just said to him, in my not this accent, I know this is bad, but it got worse. Um, can my, my usual boy's not about? He's, his phone's off. Have you got a number for me? And he went, Yeah, 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 girl, I can help you. And I thought, Oh, amazing. That's easy. He said, But um, if I take you there, we chip me off. I went, Yeah, yeah. I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and then on the way, he's ch chatting to me about, he's got this jewellery, he's burgled a house the day before and he's got this jewellery, did I want to buy it? And he's showing me it. But my copper instinct was like, oh yeah, I need to buy it because it's evidence. And then I was like, but then I won't have enough money for the crack. So I was like in this pull between burglary and drugs. <laughs> and but then I realised as well, he wanted me to chip him off. He meant give him some drugs. And I was thinking, well, that means I'd be supplying him the drugs and I'm not allowed to do that because then I'd be dealing. That's how my brain used to work. Um, we got to his address. He spoke to the dealer at the door. The dealer went back in, went to the front room window, lifted up the neck curtain with another guy. 
they looked me up and down and went like this. And I just I just assumed they were giving me the nod of, we'll serve her up because she looks all right. She doesn't look like a copper. He's come back, serve, give the, geek, the guy from the bookies the gear. He's chipped it off and he took the piss. He took a lot. But at this point, I don't care. I just, I'm so happy to nearly have the drugs. Um, me and my guy from the bookies have said our goodbyes and... I've started scurrying off up, back up the street. I'm so happy. I've got crack in my pocket and I'm I'm buzzing. I'm so happy that I've got the gear. And then the dealer comes out of the house and chases me up the road and is like, Oi, yo, yo, yo. I was like, oh, fucking hell. Hello. <laughs> and he was like, um, I'll walk you. And I'm like, walk me where? And he said, like, I'll just walk you. And I was like, I don't need you to walk me. I can walk myself. And then he said, where's the, where's the gear? And I thought, shit, he's going to rob me. I said, I plugged it. And he was like, nice. And he just, I'm like, listen, I said, if my man sees me with you, he's going to really fuck us up. Like, you need to go. And he was like, no, 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 I'm going to walk you, innit? I was like, I swear to you, my boy will come and he will see me with you and he will just beat you. He's massive. And he was like, no, 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 he won't. He won't beat me. And I'm thinking, fuck off. Like, I don't want you here. Um, and then we're walking along and he just literally grabs me. He's got my hair. And he pulls me down this alleyway and I thought, oh, here we go. So he doesn't want to rob me. And he's telling me what he wants. And I'm like, I can't have sex with you. I was like, my man will kill you. And I'll tell him and he will kill you. And he was like, no. He said, I don't want, I don't want that. I mean, you can just suck me off. And I was thinking, fuck. How am I getting out of this? I'm not, pla this is not supposed to happen. I've gone from being like on the, the biggest high I've ever had in my entire life. Because I've just bought crack and I've, I've successfully bought from this job. And now I'm in an alleyway with the dealer and he's trying to, he's literally undoing his trousers and, I'm, and he's got me and I can't move. And I'm like, I could still see the alleyway. And he was bigger than me, so I can't run because he would have outrun me. And I just thought, I'll bite it. If I bite, he's, I'll bite it. And that's going to hurt and it's, he's going to go down. And then I'll just leg it. And then I'm just stuffing and he's, he's faffing around. And then this vehicle's pulled up at the end of the alleyway. And I'm like thinking, what the, what's going on? I'm, I didn't know if it was for me or for him. And this geezer's come running towards me, calling me, he's like, you fucking slag, what are you fucking doing? And I like looked, so I thought, I recognise him, why do I know you, why do I know you? And he was from my briefing. And I, it hadn't, because I was all new to this, I hadn't realised the phone I had was two-way and they could hear everything that was happening. So they obviously realised I was in the shit and come and sent him out, but to pretend he was my boyfriend. And then the geezer's gone to the dealer said to my boyfriend and um, she wanted it I'm really sorry mate she she it was her she wanted it and I was just like prick like so you say sorry to him but you won't say sorry to me um and it was all tea and medals when I got back they were all like that was amazing like you did amazing I'm thinking but really I just got dragged down an alley and you've had to send someone to come and rescue me um and they're like do you think you'd go back and buy from him again I was like yeah yeah I'll, I think I'll be all right now so that was it. I just kept going to back and buying from him. And it's sad that as well, but because it goes to show with people with addictions that, that they'll get abused every day. Every day. And that's Honestly. the heartbreaking thing. That was the first thing that came to my mind, but who else has he done that to? Oh, and do you know, a lot of the women that I, not, not that I was infiltrating them, but so if I was on a particular job and there was women there that were addicted to crack or heroin, they would do that for the free gear. Yeah. Like, and men. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think I ever come across him personally, but yeah, definitely. Did he eventually get the jewel? He did go and he was fuming. Did he see you? I didn't have to give evidence, but apparently when they, because um, obviously in disclosure they have to tell him mm -hmm. what's happened, and they said he was, it was an undercover operation, you've been selling drugs to an undercover police officer. Apparently his face just hit the floor. But it could have been worse. He could have got done for a lot more than just dealing me drugs. So he didn't get done for sexual assault or anything? No. Why not? Don't know. He should have, though, eh? Hmm? CPS, probably. I don't know why he didn't. That's crazy, man. Yeah. What if I, I, don't, well, I don't think he did, because if he did, they would have told me, so I just assume he hasn't, but maybe he did. But how does that work? Is that because you're undercover as well? That... No, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to ask about that, because I don't know. I know he went to prison for the drugs, but I don't know about... What happened if that cop never showed up? You'd have had half a penis. <laughs> 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 yeah, I would have had to do it because what else would I have done? I'm going red side because I've just said the word penis. 
<laughs> so that's your first experience yeah that was my first ever job see once you calm down next day do you think this is it that did you, was it a, an attraction of the ups and downs the emotions the adrenaline or did you think that's a bit too much that could have been anybody you could have died basically yeah. your first job like did you how was the feeling the next day if it was now, I would think of it different. But at the time, I was being told that was amazing. That was brilliant. You were so good. And I was like, oh. And the adrenaline of buying gear was like, I'm a police officer and you've just paid me to buy drugs. Mm -hmm. And now I've been told that was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about any other danger or I wanted the next job. But see, when you're getting told you're good and stuff, because I've spoken to enough coppers now, they're used. Yeah, yeah. Totally used. Do you think part of it being you being groomed as well? You've done a good job. It was amazing. But inside their mind, they're thinking you could have been, you could have got put in serious harm there. You were in serious harm. But do you ever think part of it is just yeah, you're doing great, patting the back, and everybody wants to do their job great. But do you yeah. think part of it's like a little sense of grooming as well. Where so so you go into the next one because they need people to do it. Yeah, I think I think to a degree it is, but I don't think the people that are telling you it's great. Uh, I think they think it's great. I think it's come like, it's a constant circle because they're like, that is actually, because we're all a bit a bit dark and a bit odd. They genuinely think it's great that you've managed to get yourself out of that situation or you've, you're, you've still got the drugs and you've not been touched up pro properly. <laughs> um, I think they believe it's real and it's a good job. I don't think they do it to necessarily groom you. I think they don't even realise they're doing it. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I just, in my brain, wanted to be one of them, so. You would do anything, basically? Yeah, I never said no to any jobs. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll go. I don't you, know what I'm doing, but I'll go. <laughs> you've kind of got to be a bit psychotic as well to do those yeah. sort of jobs, even though it is kind of, it's a massive attraction. Like if, if anybody who's got to join the corporate, you think, yeah, I want, that's undercover, and you see the films, and you think it's glamorous. Yeah. When you actually speak to undercover police officers, you think, that ain't glamorous. The majority of ones I've spoke to heads are fried. Yeah. Yeah, so, they are. Uh, the man I had on, he was an undercover paedophile man, and I always thought, I thought, why? Like, I'm a father, so I understand the protection of kids, and I'm overprotective. I'm quite controlling in a way where mm -hmm. I'm probably too overprotective, but I've spoken to enough people to understand how bad the streets yeah. are, and people don't realise that he went deep undercover, and I always ask the question, why? Because he, when he got offered his first job, he saved a kid, saved a kid. Yeah. And I, and I couldn't fathom how he can control your emotions and it takes a braver man to do do so, so I respect him. But he says, look, James, how could I walk away? Somebody had to do the job. How mm -hmm. could I walk away knowing that I've just saved a kid? If I don't keep doing this, how many kids are going to yeah. get damaged? And it made sense to me. Okay, I respect that, but you can, the, 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 the psychology and stuff, the mindset that he has to go through every day and watching those videos and the screams and stuff, and he had to take it all in to yeah. try and put these people in prison. And... I respect that. I genuinely do respect that. And I respect anybody who goes deep undercover to then do the right thing, even though it fucks them up mentally. It destroys their life. Yeah, destroys absolutely. Their life. And there's a lot of cops that are like that. But I, I watched that one and he, he is, that's what you aspire to be, isn't it? He's yeah. making a difference. And it sounds so cheesy and cliche, but ultimately you do join the police to make a difference mm. because why else would you do it? It's not for the pay because that's not very good. The pension's not as good anymore as it was. So why else would you join? It's, you want to you want to be a good human and you want to make yeah. difference and get bad people off the street. Um, and let's be honest, paedophiles are the worst people on the planet, aren't they? Yeah, I agree. It's disgusting. Mm. Um, so cops like that, yeah, fair play to him. Yeah, they should be getting every every reward possible. Yeah, to try and help better their lives and make them live in a better comfort. But if you're getting paid buttons and then what happens is you he you just used. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. Then what was it all for then? But he did save children, I guess. And if he didn't, but part of these children would be dead or a lot of these kids, eight, nine, ten, are prostitutes and in their mind they think it's yeah. normal. They're just going around flats and they're getting passed around and it's so heartbreaking. People don't realise the depths yeah. of the shit that goes on, not just in the UK, but worldwide. All the trafficking and everything that goes with it. It's fucking heartbreaking. But will it ever change? I don't think so because human beings, there's too many on the planet. There's yeah. too much confusion out there with everybody. A lot of people don't know right from wrong. I made lots of mistakes in my life. I'm trying to rectify it. I believe I'm a better person trying to do more right 
understand mm-hmm. wrong but we're human we fuck up but yeah. when you go down this dark dark place and you don't realize the extent so a lot of people live in their wee bubble a little true. 95 and they go home have their little drink have their dinner straight back up the next day when you actually start questioning things and looking into things a lot deeper you start to realize this place is mad yeah and we're kept away from it but noise entertainment nothing that doesn't go on he's crazy he's a conspiracy theory theorist but i'm telling you man it goes a lot dark dark yeah. deep than what people realize and that's the mad thing about it so after your first one close call are you thinking listen i'm one of the boys i'm i'm doing it i'm m- making waves <laughs> no. just want to go back to the next job <laughs> no i didn't realize how hard it was to become part of the i call i call it the bigger boys club they don't call themselves that because that would be really lame um but it they were older a lot older than me more experienced than me um so that you you don't get the good good jobs until you've proven yourself on the crap job so that until I, I can't go and start doing pub work that's what I've like you can go in a, anyone can go in a pub and buy gear but I wanted to do them jobs because I'm like well that's I could go in there almost as myself all I need to do is just not mention the police bit and the rest of it will be fine so I wanted to do them ones um but no they didn't come for ages I still had to go and do I had to be a prostitute on the street and I don't like that term but um I guess that's the term we all yeah. recognise. Um, and it sounds awful, but some of them yeah. jobs were, like, funny. And this this stuff only would happen to me. Like, the first ever pedo, uh, not pedophile job, prostitute job I did, I was stood in a red light area. This is horrendous, actually. And this woman's come over to me and she's, what you know, like what you see in the press and in the media, like, typically, stereotypically, what you would imagine she would look like. Mm-hmm. She didn't have many teeth really not a really nice lady and she come over she went oh all right girl and I, I was like oh hello all right and these jobs work differently so on normally you don't have a safety team but on these you do because you just never know how far it will go and you're visible so you can hide a surveillance team who are watching you quite easy um got two way on my phone so they can hear everything that's been said never been here in my life and she goes all right girl I was like oh hello she went I ain't seen you for ages and I'm, I'm thinking, hmm, that was a bit rude. <laughs> I've never been here before. But, I mean, it's good. <laughs> but what a cow. So I know I know they can hear it and I know they're going to be like, oh, is there something you want to tell us? Mm-hmm. I said, oh, yeah, I've been at my nan's. She went, oh, she said, oh, fucking old Bill, are you? CID, because they call everything in a plane, uh, an unmarked car, CID. Fucking CID over there. So she's got the surveillance team already. And she said, um, I'm wanted. She said, so I'm going to go in the park. If you see any that you don't fancy, because obviously I'm going to fancy all of my punters, <laughs> um, send them in. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. I said, be be careful. She was like, yeah, stay safe. And off she's gone. And I've just kind of looked out the corner of my eye. They're just cracking up because they're like, she obviously knows this woman, but I don't. It's just that she just assumes she knows me. And she wants something from me. She wants me to send the punters to her. Um, so I've stood there for a little while and this guy's come out of this building I don't know how much how much I can say on this without being totally crude, but um, he came over. He's a very big gentleman, and he was like, "Hello." I said, "Hello," and he went, "I said, what do you want?" And he went, "Dry anal." But I can see the car is now rocking because they are crying with laughter, and I, I just went, "Dry," like I've never even heard of that. <laughs> like what? And he was just like, "Do you do dry anal?" And I was like, "I'm waiting for a cab." And he was like, oh, okay. And he like walked off. And obviously when he's way out of sight, he gets nicked. And um, process. He went, he said he didn't say that. And I'm like, he did say that. Where would I have got that from? Of course he said it. So we went to court and he brought his wife to court. And I was just like, and there was three magistrates and they are obviously really, their shoulders are like, because they're thinking, dry anal. Like, this is ridiculous. He should have just paid the fine. no. Their shoulders are like going up and down. I'm just standing there thinking I've got to say in court what has happened. So I'm relaying it. And all of a sudden his wife stood up and went, look at her. She looks like she would do that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to be professional because I don't, I don't know what to do. But I'm like, this is like ridiculous. She's saying, I look, what does someone look like who does that? The magistrates are, cannot even <laughs> control themselves anymore. And they're profe- very professional they had to like just say to him like we're gonna have a break because everyone was just cracking up um 
And that was like my second job, dry anal. And the wife said, I look like I do dry anal. <laughs> but he's told his wife that you had made it all up? Yeah. What was his charge? Uh, I don't know what he got charged with, actually. It's normally a fine, like an FPN. That's like a fixed penalty notice they would get. For like, it'd be like 60 quid, 100 quid. Mm -hmm. But he, he, I guess, soliciting, I don't know. So you do, what's the process to like dressing up and stuff? How do you get it? Do you look at photos or do you watch films? Like, where do you get the, the kind of characteristics to kind of play that part? For the street sex yeah. work? Yeah, you can't, you know like what you see on the telly where it's like short skirts and fire Fashion boots? Eggs. Yeah, it's none of that. You just are literally <laughs> almost mm. myself. Um, nothing revealing, so it's not encouraging them to... Yes, you're in a red light area, but you're not encouraging them to come to you because you're scantily dressed. Or, And in reality, most of the girls on the street don't dress like that anyway. It's really rare um, that they're stood there in fishnets and so they've only got a massive coat on because it's freezing and mm -hmm. boots. <laughs> How many girls would normally work in the red light districts? It would vary depending on where you was, but yeah, you'd see a lot. Of, you could see 10, 20 girls on eye easy. And that's the ones that are on the street. That's without the ones that are in houses. A lot of men drive through. More than you would even think. And it's no stereotype with the men either. So one day you would see like what you would think. And then the next day you'd have like three piece, pinstripe suit, nice car. And you'd be like, wow. But in your head, you'd think they'd go to escorts and no, they go to the street. And Majority of men are perverts. It's a perverted mind. But a lot yeah. of these guys will sleep with these women are addicts. And yeah. then go home, home with their wife and kids. Yeah. But some of the ladies as well aren't, like, I was really shocked once. There was a lady who I thought, well, she doesn't, it sounds awful, but I was surprised to see her because what I'd seen previously were, were drug users and stuff like that. Not And not all of them are. The girls, not all of them are. But they're putting themselves in such danger. It's horrible out there. It's, it's really horrible. But this lady was, she had a full-time job. She was going through a divorce and her husband stopped paying for their kids' private school. And she didn't want her kid's life to be so damaged. So she was going out, selling herself, um, so she could keep the kid in private school. Yeah, damaging herself to try and help her son. I felt so bad for her. Yeah, it's sad. But I've done a homeless documentary, the woman who was on the street, she got raped twice in a day. Yeah. It's just horrendous, isn't it? Doesn't even report that, because there's no point. That's so sad. Yeah. It is sad. Did you see a lot of that? The girls, a lot of the girls were, yeah, damaged, and they a lot they they would have like conversations about how they would do it and then not get paid, and they say they wouldn't report it because they would just be told, well, you did it, but you, it's just because there was no transaction of cash, you're saying it's rape. They felt like that and would say that, and it's like, and then they go back out again. So how does that work with them if that did happen? What happens if they did report that? Would they also get charged with being a prostitute? They could. I mean, is it in the what public interest? What is the charge, interest? though? There, there is. There are. Selling I can't, yourself. Can't think, yeah, there is. There are charges for it. But <clears throat> is it in the public interest, really? Like, it's ridiculous. Like, it's the oldest profession in the world. It's not going away. And is it worth arresting the girls? It's not going to stop them doing it again. They're going to go back out after. So, see, look, brothels. There's brothels everywhere in the UK. Mm. Like, why? How can they still operate? I don't understand that. There is loopholes. I don't know the ins and outs but of this. But why are they not? They're blatantly there. They used to yeah. run outside the Sheriff Court in Glasgow, right outside that. Yeah. And it's just, you see people coming in and out, you're thinking, like, why is that still there? There is, there is. I can't Same remember Same as what escorts when on websites and stuff. Is it just yeah. kind of normalised, but it's just kind of forgotten about? Or is there a team that actually tries to shut them down? Like, I don't think it, I don't think it's like illegal, is it? I don't know. I don't think so. I might be wrong. I don't know every law, but... Um, I know, I'm sure there's some kind of loophole where it's like, if it's this, then it, it's okay. Massage parlour? I don't, yeah, it might be that. I don't know. I remember watching a documentary years ago and it was the woman that owned it. She said, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, there must be a loophole because yeah. fucking loads of them. Loads. A lot of them in the mold, you know what I mean? But I just, <laughs> I've spoken to enough people who are porn stars and that who actually work in. Yeah. Escort on Andy, the, the, part, the massage parlours, and I'm thinking, fucking hell, that's a lot. But the girl we were talking about earlier, Sophie, yeah. like, she does escorts, she does porn, she does everything. Yeah. You kind of see the same resemblances of the girls who do the streets to escort and. It's madness. And it's stripping it's, porn. It's all kind of the same, under the same umbrella. Yeah. It is, it's, I find it really interesting. Like, I'm, I'm really interested in it all. But it's crazy that you, when you go, before I did this, 
work and you know you go to a hotel I wouldn't bat an eyelid at, at, at he was in the bar but now obviously we go and I'm like oh my god there's six escorts in here and Ben or my partner will be like is that what you're sit, like sitting there looking at and I'm like yeah because I, like I've worked with these girls and I know what's coming for them later and it's not the best what? I know they choose to be there but what's the standout to know you just do I can't explain it like they'll probably be on their own drinking something very nice they'll look really nice they'll be dressed much better you know I'll probably be in there in like the, like skins a hoodie <laughs> and like a, a hat and they'll they'll look nice you know they look pristine and you know that they're and it's 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 in a lot of hotels especially nice hotels um I remember my first ever escort job I got chatting to this girl and I thought she was amazing like the stuff she was obviously she didn't know who I really was but I just told her I was really new to it all and stuff and she's like oh you're gonna love it and she was giving me all these tips about who I should be like going for because they're big tippers and they're gift buyers and I was like bloody hell I'm not surprised you're getting all that money and then a Louis chucked on top as a gift I'm like I might be in the wrong job here <laughs> <laughs> So see when you get like when you do the streets like you're catching it's it's kind of just all petty crimes. Yeah. Like see when you start moving through the ranks, does it become more dangerous? Or is it always dangerous? Clearly, for your first job, like there's never yeah. any. Or it's a it's a it's a bigger job, so it's going to be more dangerous. So it's always you've kind of always got to be on guard. It depends on the job, like and I'll, I when I used to do the street drugs, like in the stairwells buying gear and stuff. Reality is. We're not gonna. I don't know why we were doing that because we're not combating drugs. And the moment that kid's nicked, because they are majority of late teens, they're kids. They'll get nicked by the time they're being booked in custody. Someone else is already in their spot because the the, the real owners, the real dealers, the, the businessmen at the top, will get someone else in because they've been nicked. So they just move someone else in. So are we doing anything about that really by nicking him? I don't think so. Um, and they can be dangerous. Like you don't want to piss these people off because ultimately they've got something you want and you're in their world they will have people around them so if you annoy them they've only got a whistle and then mm -hmm. you can get a kick in so see when you're escorting like, who are you trying to catch have you got a certain target or you, you try to catch a certain somebody somebody who's rating people like, how does it work or you just try to catch people who's paying for escorts it changes like so the first one, that one I was mentioning, it, we knew there was a bad batch of gear in the West End. I'm giving away a lot now. Um, and it was getting, like, we knew it was being served up to the escorts. So they said, you go in, you nut into the escorts and see who the dealers are. And that was basically, that was to establish who it is. Um, she was very kind and she did give me her number of her dealer because she felt sorry for me because I'm new. Um, and she did get, she went outside actually and picked up while I was there. And obviously I was like having a little look, car indexes, trying to remember it, couldn't remember it. Um, obviously can't stop writing it down because that's not going to work, is it? Um, but she did give me numbers. Um, so although I'm nutting into the escort on that occasion, I'm not, es I'm escorting, but I'm not escorting, I'm not dealing with a man. Um, another one was a guy, he was actually a high ranking military officer. Uh, there'd been reports that he'd been getting escorts. So... Um, they put me in front of him as an escort at a, at a dinner and he took the bait, we'll say. <laughs> and um, Very touchy-feely. <laughs> I did have to keep saying, could you remove your hand? And we're at the dinner. So he was, a, yeah, he was wrong. And, he, and yeah. How much were you charging? Oh, it would vary. <laughs> it would depend who it was. It depends on how, how long they wanted my time for. <laughs> That's mad, is not it? You had to do that. Did you have a husband at the time? another story um yes and how does he handle that ended in divorce <laughs> did you lose a lot do you in that job because I, the with the undercovers i speak to the they're all married two or three times a very they struggle yeah. a lot to keep because it's either them or the job in it yeah do you find a lot of that in undercover work yeah he didn't know that i was doing it <laughs> just as well isn't yeah. it? was that that case no, I mean, it was the best thing that ever happened, that divorce. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Does the job play a lot to do with that, though? Or was it just a relationship that didn't work? It, it wasn't working anyway, but he found my phone, my, one of my dirty phones, and was like, who's this? And obviously, when I tried to explain, and I was telling him the truth, I was like, this is what I've been doing. He was like, bollocks. And I was like, 
it's, tr- it's actually true. And he was like, no. And I was like, if you could see this geezer's face, you'd realise I'm not having an affair with him, like, seriously. Um, and he's like, I'll ask your mum then. And I'm like, you can, but she don't know. And he's like, oh, I suppose your dad knows, eh? And I was like, yeah, my dad knows. But my dad was the only one because no one else needed to know. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's not undercover then, is it? No, if ever, I'm telling everyone, like... So that ended in divorce, in divorce and it was a very messy divorce, like crazy messy. Um, but I was really lucky that I had the covert stuff because I could live my other life and not have to worry about my real life. Mm. Um, and it's, again, it's only now I've left and I'm looking back, I'm like, that was actually mental because I was going through so much personally. It was, it was horrible. And I had a little girl at the time. It was a mess. It was a complete mess. He was fighting me for custody of her. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen, is it? Like, don't be silly. I'm not going to stop you from seeing Of course, I would never do that. But don't start trying to do that. That's really, mm-hmm. that's out of order. Do you feel as if living the double life helped you get through the madness? That, without a doubt. Being yeah. somebody else? Yeah, not even a shadow in my head. Um, and it was fun, not funny, but at the time, my mum, I, oh, this is awful to say, but I'd created a bit of a, a eating disorder. And I never realised it until even probably five, six, seven years ago. I wouldn't have classed it as that. Um, and my mum was getting quite worried and she said, look, you're getting really skinny, Dan. And I played it off that it was like, yeah, but Posh Spice, because I love her, um, she's a size zero. And, uh, you know, even it was all in the press, oh, size zero, Gap are doing skirts and they're a size zero. It was all that sort of thing. And I was like, yeah, I'm just doing that. And my mum was like, I don't think you should do it. You're like, you look really ill. Um, and I used to get really sore ribs when, you know, when you lay down and you're so skinny, my ribs used to really hurt. And I was just taking laxatives, like literally pa- like packets of laxatives. And my mum was getting panicked. And then she showed me some pictures and she said, look, sh- this woman was addicted to laxatives. And look at her. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't want that because Amelia, um, and my little girl, um, but that was the only thing I was controlling in my real life. And I only realised this much later on that actually that was a proper eating issue I had. And that was the only thing I could control. And then when I go to my fake life that I liked more than my real life, I was having the best time ever. And I didn't have to worry about controlling what I was eating or drinking or, but at home I would. It was crazy. Yeah. So see, when you go through all that as well, that do you find it hard to ba- find balance because you're a bit young, not naive, but you're kind of just trying to do the right thing? Do you find it difficult to find balance with relationships, with being a mother, with being an undercover copper? Yeah. Do you struggle with the balance of it? Yeah, I didn't have any balance. I was all in my fake life, my police life. I had no balance at all. Um, Amelia's like, we'd be, I'd, I had mum guilt, but I would immerse myself in my other world so I would like not have to think about the mum guilt. And then, like, the homework. So she'd be in the car doing her homework. I'd be picking her up from my mum's or my dad's. And I'd be, she'd be like, oh, I've got homework. And I'd be like, right, come on then, let's quickly do it in the car. Because when we get home, I've got to put her to bed. And then my mum, if, if I've picked up from my dad's, my mum would be coming around so I can go back to work. So I'd literally be there for bedtime, wake up, drop off to school, pick up sometimes. And it was just this horrible, constant, vicious circle of just throwing myself back into work being there when I need to like be there because I'd have the mum guilt and then I'd go to work mm-hmm. it's just it was no there was no balance at all what was the, the job you had to do when you had to dress up as a school girl yeah that was actually I laugh about it because that's just the humor isn't it um so I was there was a job there was a guy who it was over 120 something offenses he'd been committing acts of um touching and it was getting a little bit worse. Each offence was getting a bit worse. So it started like over over clove touching and it was upskirts and stuff like that. And it was all schoolgirls. Um, they tried surveillance, couldn't get him. He was super, super CCTV aware. They had one grainy image of him where you couldn't even really see his face. And they just couldn't couldn't get him. I like just couldn't get him. So they said, we're going to put a decoy out um, and see if we can, if he takes the bait, basically. And I was a decoy. And I'd done hundreds of decoy jobs that had never worked, ever. Um, and they said, it, it's the TSG were my safety. And they're like, the, you know, like the, what you see at the football. They're in the vans, like, so they're all lads. They were my safety and they 
gave me a school uniform and said, can you go and put that on? This is your outfit for the thing. And when I walked back in, we can imagine a late 20-something year old and a school uniform looks ridiculous. They all give me loads of banter. It was funny. And for two weeks, I just stood in this area where we thought he might appear. Their intelligence, I didn't have the intelligence, they had it. Um, we had a full team on it. We had a, you know, officers, bin men. We had a house, people in houses in the back of vans. They, I was properly surrounded in case he, he came out. Um, and then on the last day of the operation, my dirty phone rang and it was the senior investigating officer and she said, just end it because he's not, he's not coming. I was like, okay, but I didn't expect him to. Um, so I'm st I just literally put my phone back, went to start walking. And I don't even know why I did it, but I just turned around like this and I saw this guy in a dark black hat, jacket, all dark clothes. And he was like creeping around the corner. You know, you get the wall and then it's like I've got a bush above it and he was like creeping around it like this but I didn't think uh, nothing of it um, and I probably didn't because when I was there for two weeks I couldn't believe how many men in white vans like wolf whistle all your way out the window and the girls are in school uniform I was like that's bad that because mm. they're quite clearly girls of school age and um, so I started walking and then I just heard behind me and I didn't even get to turn around. And he grabbed me around the throat and pulled me to the floor and ejaculated all over me. And I was just like, is that actually, I couldn't even believe it. Like, is that real? Like, I don't know. And what felt like the long time it wasn't, it was like literally a couple of seconds. They obviously jumped on him, got him, nicked him. And I had a camera on my backpack and we caught it on the camera. You caught him creeping, undoing his trousers masturbating to the point of got, he got me and then when he got me, his hands on me, he just ejaculated. And it was him. It was the guy. What did he get? I don't know. He went to prison. I don't know what sentence he got. Like 10 months, 12, a year? I, I, I think it was multiple years, but not, not much. Not not for what he'd been doing, for the volume of offences. Why is the, the, the prison sentence is so lenient with sex cases? I have no Because idea. there's so many of them? I literally don't know. I've, I think the, the sentencing is, it's not a deterrent, is it? It's, it's just ridiculous. I don't, there's no, I don't feel like a lot of the sentences are punishment. No, because that's why they keep re-offending. Re yeah. But once they've got it in their mind, that, that mindset can't be changed. Yeah. That's the scary thing about sex cases, man. Like their mind is gone. Yeah. But Russia, life in, life in prison. Yeah. Obviously with wars and stuff, I'm not getting into all that shit, but the, the, the laws for sex cases is spot on. Australia, mm -hmm. take their passports, take their driving license, can't leave the country, can't change their name. The UK, they can change their name for less than 20 quid. They yeah. can be a different person. They can then do what they want to do, move a, move to a different country, move to a different place and they'll get a new identity. Like, yeah. Their laws are terrible here. Kid in Scotland raped a 13 year old and they get community service. Yeah, that's, like, that's not on, man. No. And the thing is, they're so protected, not just outside the prison, in prison as well. Yeah. There needs to be certain things put in place that these people need to be kept away from kids. Look, like, people are just coming out and they're put in front of schools and they're staying in whatever they want. Like, it's, they're so well protected, it's unbelievable. And things need to change because things seem to be getting worse. I don't know if social media's made it worse. Mm. Do you think with mobile phones and technology now, it's easy to be undercover? Do you think it's more difficult? I wouldn't do it now. Why? Because even if you create a fake profile, which you would need, you still got to have some kind of interaction with it. That you'd be managing like 30, 40 accounts to try and make your one account seem real. You know, if you meet somebody, you do just find them on Instagram and add them on Instagram or on Twitter or whatever it might be. But how can you do that? I, I couldn't think of anything worse. My job now, my real job, I work in cybersecurity, and we deal with fake accounts all the time and we get them taken down but you would have to have like and we have fake accounts but you would have to have a huge volume to make your one look real so that's a full-time job isn't it just sitting there constantly interacting with your and we do all live our lives online so to go out and be deployed and say I don't have it do you though like that's that's not gonna work how many jobs did you do undercover I have no idea what was the hardest one you done uh probably the pedophile stuff what was that like? You felt like you was doing a good job. And again, it's only now I've left that I think about these things. Um, 
you're doing a good job that you're, you're you're saving someone because I would be nine times out of ten I'd be playing the the, the child. Um, so if they're saying these horrible things that they're going to do to me, I'm an adult and I know that they might say that to me and I can process it and I didn't process it, it's only now I process it. But if that's a genuine child, that's not right, is it? Like how can they process that when they're that young and they've got their whole lives ahead of them? It's just, it's just not right. Like I used to be happy it was me and not the kid because... I don't know how you would deal with that as a child. I just don't know. What was the first Peter Fool job you done? It was an online case where they'd been speaking to. Um, so it was actually a, the unit, the Peter Fool unit, um, were talking to this guy online. But they were getting suspicious. It was on Skype. He was getting suspicious that um, he was a copper, and he said he wanted a call, a video call on Skype. Um, so they called me in and said, "You need to speak to him. I had to read the transcript." So I knew what the conversation had been and speak to him. And the conversation had been horrific, like it was disgusting. And then I just went on to Skype with him and he was talking to me. And I was trying to make it, in my own head, I was trying to make him see I'm a kid. Like I was saying, to, he said, oh, what have you been up to? And I said, I've just got home from school. And he went, oh, cool. But like didn't bat an eyelid. And I was thinking, that's not, that's so weird, isn't it? Like, it's just weird. Um, and he said he had a present for me. He was a proper, I mean, I know they're all very strange, but he, the stuff he was saying was just, he had kinks about picking me up. And I was like, I don't even know what, what that is. And he kept saying, when I see you, I'm going to pick you up. And I was like, oh, okay, but I'm heavy. <laughs> and he was like, no, I'm going to pick you up. And the DC that had been speaking to him was like, yeah, he keeps talking about this picking up thing. I don't know what he's on about. Um, and he said, I've got a present for you. Do you want to see it? And I was like, what is it? And he, I was like, oh, God. It's undone his trousers, showed me his penis. But I've got a room full of, like, well, not a full, but a couple of DCs, and they're like, oh, like, they know what's happened. They can hear the conversation. They're like, oh, she's just been showing his dick. Um, and he's touching himself. But I, I can't even, I, my face is like, so I just shut the lid of the laptop, because I'm like, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> what the fuck? I wasn't expecting to do that. I thought it was going to be a chat. Um, and then I rang him back once I'd calmed down and like, I'm not going to, we, we, ha we, well, I laughed because I, I'm like, I don't know even how to deal with this. And if I don't laugh, I'll cry and be in a dark room for years. So I laughed and um, I phoned him back. He said, did you see that? And I was like, see what? And he was like, I did that for you. And I was like, did what for me? He said, did you not see it? I said, no, just do it again. And he went, I can't do it again. And he'd obviously ejaculated. And I was like, just do it again. And he was like, I can't do it again. I did that for you. He said, why did you hang up? I said, my mum came in the room. Again, like, I'm trying to give him messages that I'm a child and he's just not getting the message or not that he gives a shit and that's why he's on the phone probably or is on the phone. Um, but when I was saying do it again, he was getting angry because he was like, you don't understand. Um, and then he said, I'm going to come and see you. And we'd arranged to meet. And he was coming to Liverpool Street Station. Um, and the team said, we need you to be there because we think he's quite he's quite suspicious. You know, he's obviously asked for a call before because he wants to make sure you're real and you're not a police officer. Um, we need you to come to the, the um, train station with us. He said, but don't worry, you're not going to interact with him. You're just coming to the station just so he sees you and will approach you. I said, all right. So we went to the train station it's obviously uh, plainclothes officers waiting to nick him because that in itself is an offence to travel. And he got off the train and he was walking towards me and then I just sort of bypassed like that and they just swooped and nicked him and took him out. And he, um, we had to, I went to court with him and um, his face just hit the floor when I said, they said, is it correct you was acting in a covert capacity? I said, yes, I was a covert police officer. Did you engage with this gentleman? Yes, that's the man I spoke to on the laptop. That is the man I saw at the train station. And he was just like, he couldn't believe it. But he, he knew it could happen. He'd been to prison before. Um, he was on the, the uh, register. But he wasn't, he, if he got, he wasn't, he's, his wants were too much that he couldn't think about what could happen to him. He wanted it too much. It's too easy. Like I say, the mind's gone. They're going to keep repeating. Look at Gary Glitter. Oh. Absolute nonsense. The only thing that can 
to him is a fucking bullet in the head and I know that's rough and I know that's but the only way you protect kids is is either bring the electric chair back or life in prison. Yeah. Kids will never be safe. And that's the scary thing. Like I've interviewed so many people to understand that how dark and demonic this fucking world is and these people can getting protected and protected for too much. We can get into the deeper route and look at Epstein and flight logs and all that shit. Why has it never been exposed? Some high profile names on this planet, where are they? Yeah. But yet we'll talk about Will Smith slapping somebody on stage and talk about so many shit that distracts us yeah. from the real noise. So see when you start doing this job, when did it start taking its toll on you? Probably when I got pregnant with my son. Um, I had a horrible pregnancy and they told me that the baby had died and it hadn't. Um, so that was that was probably when I started thinking, oh my God, because of course you you know these things happen, but you don't expect anything like that to happen to you, do you? Um, and that's when I kind of probably sat back and thought, what am I doing? Um, and that job, that, that, that one with the schoolgirl um, outfit, I had got a letter from the girl's mum, a couple of the victim's mums, say, and one of them in particular really made me think, like, I'm not really an emotional person, but I was welling up reading this letter and she wrote me a thank you letter saying that her daughter now was no longer taking sleeping tablets and she was no longer wet in the bed. Mm. And I just thought, oh my God. Like, as a parent, I can't even, it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. I can't imagine what she, that mum was going through, let alone the little girl. Like, this madness. And I just thought at that point, you know, and then I got pregnant with my son and I just thought, what am I doing? I'm actually putting everyone else before my children and I don't want to do that anymore. And because I was pregnant, I wasn't allowed to be deployed. So I was at home more. Um, so I was doing more with Amelia and I liked it. I liked being at home with her and she liked me being at home with her. Um, and then my partner at the time, Albert's dad, he, he was at UC and um, we joke about this because we say we did take the job a little bit too far. We were deployed and then I ended up having a baby nine months later. So um, we went very deep undercover and he left because he was, he was, his brain was fried with it. So he left and he was headhunted by a company in France to go and work in France. And he said, well, when the baby, like, you take the year off after you had the baby, maternity leave, why don't you just come and live in France? I was like, that's a great idea. So me, Albert and Amelia went to France. I took a career break. I took, actually took a five-year career break. Um, it's a big ass break, isn't it? Yeah, you can take five years. And I said, can I take the five years? And do you know what? I had this lovely lady governor and she was really nice. And she used to get a lot of crap actually from people on the borough. They didn't like, I liked her because she just told it how it was. Um, and I think the police need that. Mm -hmm. And um, I said to her, Look, I need to take some time out. She knew what had happened with my pregnancy and stuff. And she said, yeah, no, I'll authorise it. And I was like, really? She was like, yeah, yeah, I'll authorise that. So five years. Uh, but I didn't take the five years after a about 18 months I left. We went and lived in France and I became mum, which was, I found it really difficult just to be mum and nothing else. How do you switch off for the madness? Is that what you struggled with? I craved it. Like I, I just thought, what, what do I do tomorrow then? So mm. Tomorrow I'm just going to wake up and do the school run. Well, then what? <laughs> like I found that really hard. I didn't have any friends in France either because where we lived was in like a bit of a village and no one spoke English not that they should were in France and my French I thought my French was really good but it was really not when I lived there um so I didn't have any friends there Albert was a baby still so he wasn't at school and I was just I went after I had Amelia I went back to work after a couple of months but with Albert I was there every day doing mum stuff and I just I, I didn't know what I was doing I was just like this is actually really hard See, that's the thing that people need to understand. What you said earlier about that little girl doesn't wet the bed anymore, she doesn't take tablets. And that there is what why you do your job. That yeah. is where why people need to see police officers. The strain and the misery they put themselves through, the, away from the kids, they lie to everybody and try to protect yeah. everybody from their own way. That's what people need to understand, the levels that police officers have to go through. So I think I have massive respect for that. Like, somebody has to do it, you've done it. But that there is a key element. But like same yeah. with undercover paedophile. If I walked away, James, who else would help save those kids? You walking away earlier 
who else would have had that little yeah. girl? She would probably maybe end up took her own life. But majority of people do when they're in so yeah. much pain and trauma. So that's what people need to understand the effort and the work that goes into an undercover copper. Well, it's it's unbelievable. It's levels. But it's also when you're trying to save people and do the right thing, you're also destruction inside yourself. Did you see that kind of messy minefield up here with trying to be a mother but knowing what's going on in life, overprotective? Like, did, did that come apart in it because of everything? Is it not to say it harder being a parent, but it's because of the, I don't know times I've said it in this podcast, but because I know who I interview now and understand what goes on, I'm so overprotective. My kids don't have sleepovers, they don't, yeah. and they hate me for it, but I just don't want it because people putting cameras in houses and other shit like that and it happens yeah. it might be a bit far-fetched and it doesn't happen to everybody but it does happen so my job is to eliminate risk yeah no i'll be the bad father so everybody can come stay here but that's not happening for you and yeah it's like that in our house <laughs> it is like that and it's it's i think now i've left i'm more it get my my daughter's 18 so she, and she knows everything absolutely everything and my little boy's 11 and he's like a real mummy's boy but I'm so like like you said protected because I've seen this stuff I'm so protective of them both I need to know where they both are at all times and I worry so much she's 18 and she'll go out and I'm, I don't sleep I'm just waiting for her to come home because I can't I can't I'm like what if but what if and I, Ben will say to me yeah but she when we was 18 you was out being a copper I'm like yeah but she's different she's she's precious but I've, I've flipped it on its head. I've gone from the mum that was doing the homework in the car to the crazy mum that goes all out now on her. And Ben says, you overcompensate. Like, you're trying to cram in now what you missed out on. I said, yeah, because she'll go to uni soon and then she's not going to come home after uni, is she? She'll go and get a house and a job and she'll start. I don't want her to have kids. I've told her no kids because it's stressful. Um, but... She'll have her own life and then she won't want me any, to help her anymore. And he's like, you think about this too much. I just, it, what will be, will be. And I'm like, my brain can't let her go. And she's 18. I'm like, but she's my baby. And he's like, it's all because of you wasn't around as much when she was little as, as you wish she was. So your partner was undercover as well? Albert's dad. <laughs> God, this sounds terrible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. well, this is, And I'm not proud of this. But it's life. My my children have different dads. Yeah, I've um, kids to different mums. And my partner I met when I was filming Hunted, Ben. Um, but we've been together seven years. Do you think that easier? Somebody kind of in the same industry understands you a bit more? Because yeah. anybody else, if you're sitting telling them these stories, they'll be going, she's off her fucking head. Yeah. Oh, he still, he says that as well. <laughs> <laughs> he does say that as well. But no, yeah, it does help. Like he, so he's, he's, um, his background, I have to word it carefully, is British intelligence. So, When's he coming on the podcast? Yeah, he's, he's not allowed to talk, but um, he, get, well, not yet. he gets slapped on the wrist all the time. But um, yeah, it's funny actually when he gets told off. Mm. Mates. How do you trust a man? Especially being dragged down alleys, somebody fucking wearing a leather coat and coming in his pants. Look, how do you then trust the process of men's psyche and thinking? When you know, listen, not all men are bad. No, not no. All, I was just going to say, I've met, I've yeah, met equally so many, amount yeah, of women I'm that not are trying to yeah. shoot men, men down because men and women are just as bad, like you say, good and bad coppers, good and bad anywhere in life. Yeah. But how, when you go through some sort of trauma like that, did you ever try and forget that and realize, okay, it's not a job, every man's not bad? Or do you then have your guard up with every man that comes into your life? I think I, I don't trust many people, not just men. I don't trust many women either. And I think actually women can be much more calculating than men. I think when men make mistakes or are untrustworthy, there's telltale signs, but women are quite clever at it. I don't trust many people at all. Like, really don't. But that's a good thing. I used to always doubt myself, oh, I don't learn how to trust, but do you know what? I'm happy with the group I've got. I'm happy with the family and friends I've got. I don't really need anybody yeah. else in my circle. Unless it's business, unless there's money to be made, unless we can take things to a new level, I'll listen. Yeah. Right now, I'm not, I'm not, and I'm in a good place. People around me are good. Because like you say, women are very manipulative and I think we can learn that now because everybody's always in a woman's favour as well. Yeah. But especially when it comes to court. Seen a video last week of women hitting herself with hammers, getting her husband or her boyfriend in trouble. I had a guy, Mo Rami on, where the young girl who just got nine years there or 11 years said that she was getting trafficked, this and that. And it was all lies. People lost their jobs. Their kids were committing suicide. Johnny Depp. 
Yeah. But it's a lot of high profile things to realise the extent goes. And the thing is, listen, the majority of sexual shit happens with men, we get it, but there's a lot of sh fucking bad stuff with the women who make lives up and destroy men's careers because yeah. there's so much, the papers and are too quick to jump on allegations. Allegations are allegations, it's not a conviction. Listen, there's a lot of people who's got away with things and never been charged who are guilty. We can go down the Jimmy Savile route, but yeah. there's a lot of people in prison who have interviewed personally that have done over 20 stretch as well that are innocent. So it's just having an open mind and understanding. There's always three sides to the story here. Mm. There's always both sides and then there's always a truth. But there's so much shit now online about stuff. And I think as much as online stuff can be a negative and damaging towards a human mind, there's also a lot of positives. You've got your own side of the platform. You can mm. get your own voice out and, and say things from your side. That like, See, when you're going through the whole, that whole life, like how long did you do it, the undercover stuff? I started, um, it was probably about just under 10 years, a decade. Did you get any psychological help when you done it? <laughs> no. I, when I had a couple of jobs, they said, you should go and see the counsellor. And I said, yeah, okay. Um, one of them, I did go to see him because they were going, you do need to go. And I was like, I'll go. And again, it wasn't, it's only now I've realised that it was a ticking box exercise, not for my benefit. Just to cover themselves. Um, and I went and he weren't there. So I'd gone to the appointment and he wasn't there. And I was like, well, I went and he wasn't there. And they were like, I'll book another one. So I booked another one. I went and he wasn't there. And I thought, I'm not doing that again. I have to get on the train to come up here and do this. <laughs> like, I'm not yeah. doing that again. So I didn't bother. Um, but it was only around the time of, you probably saw it, where they UC had got the uh, person he was infiltrating pregnant and the units shit themselves. And started getting more forms and paperwork to, just to cover mm -hmm. backsides but I don't I'm not a police basher I'm a mass I'm super pro police I think what's happening at the minute is really sad it's just and no one hates a bad copper more than a good copper honestly I went to an event last night with an ex-DCI and we were talking about what's in the press at the minute like the Wayne Cousins and stuff like that and we were like it's just wrong isn't it like I just don't it's just so wrong and I don't think his nickname was the rapist. I would have called that. I wouldn't have called it out, but I'd have asked, what's that all about? And the DC, I said, Jim, I would have said, why they call him that's a bit, that's a bit dark, that. Mm -hmm. It's not like calling him like, I don't know, whatever. That's, that's, that's a bad name. That's a bad nickname. Um, I just think they've got themselves in this horrible mess. I think the new management, I think mom, um, Owens will be great. She's Lynn Owens. She's, she started at the bottom. She worked her way up. She retired, went to the NCA, retired, and come back as the assistant commissioner. I think she's, I, I think she's going to be good. Yeah, something does need to change, especially the numbers are dropping. I don't know if it's to do with funding and stuff as well. Nobody wants to do that job. The recruitment's so poor, though. They did a, a scheme where you could join a rank, so you could join a senior management position if you had a degree. What? The worst people, that, the worst coppers are academics. Like you want people that know how it is on the street. Yeah. You know, you need to, you can't make decisions, big decisions that impact your 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 teams if you've never done that job yourself. Like, you know, they, you need to be a PC on the streets and work your way up. Then you're qualified to make mm -hmm. the decisions. Just because you've got a degree doesn't mean you're going to be a good copper and nor does it mean you're going to be good at making a decision on policing. And look at recruitment. It's poor we're short of i think it's just under ten thousand cops we're short of and the runs that they have recruited are pretty poor yeah. not all of them of course but like not in a million when when i joined i sound like an old woman but when i joined they wouldn't have got in some of these people they're they're just not qualified for it and um, they've scrapped hendon now you don't go and live at hendon anymore that was part of it like that was part of the like the morale and and there's people jumping on bandwagons now as well about misogyny. I never saw that. I'm not saying it didn't happen, because it probably did. I never saw that. But it's all fucked up now, man. It's all this gender stuff and all this. But back in the day, it was gone with it. Yeah. And, all, and I've been saying this recently, that like mental health's on the rise. Suicide's on yeah. the rise. But yeah, we speak out about it most than we've ever done. Yeah. Is that the issue that we're actually speaking about it and people are then jumping on it and thinking, okay, I have got mm. problems and really it's just problems that 99% of the world have. Back in the day, it's 
slap behind the head, get fucking on with it. Listen, yeah. that's it. Look, we've got to find a bit of more strength. And I wouldn't say toughen up. And I was always for speaking out and speaking up. But the bottom line is, man, when you've got issues, nobody fucking cares. Yeah. Get on with it. Like, it's good that so many people are speaking about mental health, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be working. If suicide's at an all time high, there's so many people are speaking out, then it's. then. It's so sad, isn't it, when you think that like, someone could be that sad and yeah, that that's it's heartbreaking. Their, yeah, so it makes me feel yeah. so sad. It's heartbreaking because I've lost many friends to suicide. I've yeah. spoke to family members who've been on the podcast who've lost kids to suicide. I get it, but there comes a time in your life if you're broken, you don't feel there's enough, then you've got to look at the things that you're doing in life. The majority of people who are struggling now are drinking, are taking drugs, or maybe overeating, not exercising. Like, yeah. There's a lot of factors. If you've still, if you're not doing any of that stuff and you're still struggling with mental health, then seek help. But yeah. if you're doing all that other stuff and you're struggling, you've got the clues there that why your mental health's fucking going wayward. The the, the gear that you're snorting, the the booze, the overeating, all the yeah. chemicals that's going to the brain, and like there's so many factors that come into play. Social media, we're looking at other people's Ugh. lives and think they've got a great life when it's just all an illusion. I'm not all even on social media as the way I used to be because I think I craved it. Yeah. Like people tell me what I was doing and you're doing amazing. It becomes a habit as yeah, well, doesn't it? I don't it? need it anymore. Like, yeah. I've kind of, I'm finding a better balance in my life. I'm understanding life a bit more. I always knew social media was bad. I still dip my toe on it from time to time, but then I can I can get sucked right in. I've waited four or five hours. Yeah. But, I was talking to someone recently and he took, um, so my friend Jordan Wiley, who was on Hunted. I know Jordan. Love yeah. Jordan. So Love Jordan. Jordan. It's Jordan's fault that this book's out because yeah. he kept nagging me to write a book. Um, but he he's a great guy he's like one of my Aye. really good mates and he says to me i'm taking a detox a social media detox and, does, I, yeah. and I was like you because he was we'd sit in a car together that. for eight oh. hours ten hours mm -hmm. a day filming and he'd, he'd just be on and i'd be like what are you doing and he'd be like i'm on instagram and i'm like get off instagram we're catching fugitives and he the, we had great banter in our car and um and then when he said he was taking the detox i was like you won't last two minutes but he's quite a determined character and he strong minded yeah and he did it's a libra thing in him mm -hmm. we're both libras and we're both quite strong minded um and he did he took on i couldn't believe it and then when he appeared back on i was like oh he's back and he was like yeah, yeah. He's, he, the way he uses it now is completely different to how he used it before mm -hmm. and when he said it i thought yeah that that's a really good idea because you wake up you go and check that and you check that and like you said you before you've even done anything you've wasted an hour of your day yeah. on, and as human beings, our attention span is getting less and less. And I don't want to go out that way. No. I want to leave a legacy. Yes, I've got to promote my podcast, but I don't need to be spending so much time, quality time. Yeah. Because I'm, a, I'm in a good place mentally and I want to enjoy life. I'm not daft. I kind of see things differently from everybody else. And I kind of try to wait it all up. Okay, this isn't good for me. My eating habits is needs to, only yeah. thing is social media and eating habits. Yeah. I master these two. I'll be all gravy in it. But I am human. I do make mistakes. I do. Yeah. But after a podcast, it kind of it's you're so it's they're quite intense, not intense, but it takes a lot of energy that like you're interviewing people and that you'll feel the drain. Yeah. So and you're hearing horrible things all yeah. the time as well. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have to with well, your your cover nearly blown at any point? Because I had a man something woods on. Neil. Neil. He's a legend. He's a isn't he? he's yeah. a fucking great. Guy. His head's gone, but he's yeah. got twitches and stuff. He's because of the shit that he had to do. But he went to pick drugs up, and a guy says, "You'll love this. Taste that." Yeah. It was a bit of speed, but he didn't want to blow his cover, so he rattled it. Yeah. And he was fucking up doing the housework for three days. Do you know, like he's the nicest guy. <laughs> you, it's only, do you know, my brain, as I said, my opinion yeah. on drugs has changed. It's because of him and a guy called Professor David Nutt. I went to, I see, I've changed now. I go mm. to listen to lectures, and they were doing a lecture at Manchester Uni, and I thought, I'm going to go and listen to them and hear them out. And they explained it about drugs and legalisation mm -hmm. and what it would, I thought, you're right. Like, what have I been thinking? Because I was institutionalised. I was told it was wrong, so I just went, it's wrong, so you shouldn't do it. But yeah. actually, it is wrong, but people still do it. So what are we going to do about that? Yeah. There's no point arresting everybody for that. So, it, yeah, Neil made me change my opinion. Yeah, I'd actually like to get Neil back on because we had that discussion about legalising drugs. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's a trillion dollar industry. There's too much money involved. You take away the drug supply. Yeah. Prisons would close down. The yeah. police, they wouldn't, you wouldn't need police. Drugs the majority of everything. things yeah. are to do with, the same as alcohol, but alcohol is never a shop. It's the most glorified drug. But you can go into depths of how the world is run. Yeah. And this is where the darkness comes in. Like, do you think kids giving sugar and schooling and 
and then it's drugs and then it's working a 95 like that's not the way your life should be you're getting no. conditioned from a young age at schools you're being programmed do you think people in schools they're trying to program you to be a leader to be an entrepreneur no you're, you're controlled and, and brainwashed to be a worker yeah. for the elite and that's my opinion on it that's what I've kind of understood and like they're not building you up for success love and money management and health and yeah, fitness you're there to sit in RE like who the fuck needs to go to RE like mathematics yes listen it's good to count and stuff we get that but you can learn that but now I believe you're conditioned at school to then work for the elite yeah you'd be a good worker but if you start thinking outside the box you become a threat you sound like my husband he, this is literally what he says about it he's like our little boy is actually homeschooled yeah I, I love that because we travel a lot so mm -hmm. he just comes with us but he says exactly the same and the alcohol thing is so interesting because where we live, the culture is to have a drink every afternoon. And we did do that. We were getting to the point of, but the first two years we lived there, we'd go and have a beer every day. And then you'd look and you go, we actually had a day off in three months with alcohol. But I, I can take it or leave it and I'll be like, um, that's yeah. me out. Then Ben will be like, yeah, but come on, let's go and have a beer. And he drinks faster than I do. I do try and keep up. I just can't. Um, and like, it was only recently he listened to a few podcasts and about alcohol. And he was like, it's actually rotten. When you think about what it does to you, it's actually rotten. And then he was telling me some stuff. So we stopped, we, we just cut it. I was like, let's just stop this. It's ridiculous. And it's cheaper where we live to have a beer or a glass of wine than it is a Coke. Mm -hmm. Not that Coke, Coca-Cola is much better, yeah. but you know what I mean? And um, yeah, he was like, I'm, I'm just giving it up. Good on him. It, it, and it was funny because we traveled to, like, to London this week. The culture is to have a beer, isn't it? Mm. We're at an event, have a beer. And he's like, oh, I don't know, you can have one. I was like, I don't know, you can have one. And I was like, why are we even doing this to ourselves? If we want one, have one, mm. just don't go mad. But, but it is a little escape. It's a it's depressant. Just, you it's, can see how people get out, become alcoholics. Listen, it's, the reason why I've done it for so long because it took me away from the pain. Yeah. I never felt pain for that moment. I was on the gear or I was on the booze. I never felt it. Yeah. So it's an escape. All the shit that you've seen, all the trauma that, like, you're a tough little fucker so <laughs> as much as you've got that friendly nature and bubbly i believe that's a character that you've you've created that's you've got it to a t but you're yeah. fiery as fuck as well that like i wouldn't want to cross either because even though you sit there all calm and innocent and the bubbly character you've got something in you where you wouldn't fucking take any shit either and yeah. that's how you ended up probably getting to where you got to in life but it's just everything people need to be aware of alcohol, they need to be aware of drugs, they need to be aware of sugars, yeah. they need to be aware of coffees and we can make excuses or oh, certain things are good for even the porn. Porn does more damage to your brain than heroin. Yeah. And that's that people don't realise. And why is it so free? Because it fucking damages your mind. It damages and grains and midbilla where people can't then they see things differently. It makes them perverted, it makes them think sex scenes are this is the way it should yeah. be and it's not normalised. The whole world is backwards, even sex, it's sexual energy exchange, it's it's soul ties there's so much energy in this life we're all thinking backwards as soon as we're born even when a woman gives birth she's giving birth on her back which is wrong artificial lights it's wrong it should be in a dark room they're cutting the umbilical cord which is wrong that's where the kid gets their nutrients but the kids are coming out drugged and crying mm. kids should they, they should be giving birth in water but it's natural everything's yeah. natural and it should, it should be squatting the umbilical cord is so important because that's where people are selling that for thousands of pounds with stem cells yeah but we can i've been doing a lot of reading and research and it might come across crazy to people but it's just open your eyes and try to question everything i'm at a stage where i'm trying to question everything my platform's getting bigger i don't want to fool anybody i'm no. just talking about from what i've experienced how i've grown how i've understood the world a little bit more i might be full of shit but just, let's just look at my life from where i was five yeah. years to where i am today something must be right I still mm -hmm. a wee bit, love a little bit of attention and I love nice things, that's all right. But yeah. it's not who I am. It doesn't define me as an individual. No. See me were going through everything that like, was your cover ever nearly blown? Where uh, you had to do something that you shouldn't have just to stay in character. I got nicked. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. How what happened? Um this, again, this would only happen to me. This wouldn't happen to anyone else. Uh, I was infiltrating a gang in a pub. And um, it was a coke job, but it was a little bit more than the. He wasn't the main main. Obviously, you're never going to get to the top of the tree, but he was quite high up in the game. And uh, nice again, nice looking lad. Well, yeah, I'm going to get it straight into you. You fall for a charm, don't you? But I think they fall for me. <laughs> <laughs> but he was clever. Um, 
and I got I knew the DJ, his name DJ Dave. He I knew he was running it for him, like getting him basically he was getting it from him and he was giving it to me. Uh, I started buying gear. Fine, no problem. Really got myself ingratiated in the pub. Not literally no problems whatsoever. No one was bothered about me being in there. Told them that I just split up with my boyfriend, so I'm vulnerable. And um, I'm staying with my nan because, you know, I'm just so emotional at the moment. I can't go home. And so they're all, like, feeling a bit sorry for me. I'm, I've been buying drugs for weeks in there. But this geezer had a girlfriend and she didn't like me at all. I think she knew I was after her man. And one Friday night, she weren't in there. And I was like, oh, amazing. So I just thought, this is it. And he was looking at me and I'm looking at him and it's all a bit weird. He bought me a drink. We've got chatting. I'm laughing at all these shit jokes. And he, he had the gear, but he still wouldn't give me it. He still made Dave give me it. But I've watched you give it to Dave and now Dave's give me it. So I've got my gear for the night, whatever. And we're having a really nice time. He's like, you should, you should get a job in here. Like, if you're that upset, you should work in here. And I was like, do you reckon? And eh. all of a sudden, the bouncers have come, because that's how nice this pub was, these bouncers have come running in. Like, the fucking police are here, old Bill are coming in. And all of a sudden, the pub starts getting raided. They've, and they went to town on it as well. They smashed all the bottles behind the bar. It was like it was snowing in there. Everyone was throwing gear in the air, dropping their gear, apart from me, because mine's evidence. And the geezer goes to me, don't say anything. I was like, as if. So she's cut the girls come over. She goes, don't put anything on you, you shouldn't have. What was that? <laughs> I don't know, why, why are you in here? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't say that. But I'm thinking, what is going on? She searched me and she's like, hmm, that's a bit more than Percy, isn't it? And I'm like, whatever. So she goes, she's nicked me. He's got nicked because he's got gear on him as well. So we've both been arrested. Both got taken down to the station and booked in and the custody officer had authorised a strip search just start strip searching me she goes top or bottom first I said well top and she's undone my jacket I've undone my jacket and I'm wearing a wire and she was like shit she said are you I said she went fuck what do I do and he was like whispering in the cell I said nothing just don't say anything in custody because he's in here just literally say nothing she was like but how are you going to get out I said someone will come and get me just say nothing so she's left just sat there for like hours thinking, it's actually, is anyone coming to get me? Because this is not nice. And eventually someone come and got me. But they had to wait until he had been booked in. He was out of the way and bedded down for the night so they could get me out without any like, hoo-ha. And she, she was nice, but she was a little bit rough. And after she was like, I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry. Because it's all on camera. And I was like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. She was like, what can I do to make it up to you? <laughs> I was um, like, I'm not complaining. Yeah. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, she's only doing her job. Yeah, she was like, but she was a little bit rough. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But I was like, but in her defense, she was a bit excited. She's nicked some of the pee wits. That don't happen every day. Mm -hmm. And everyone else in the pub hadn't got a nick apart from me and him. So she's thinking, that's not bad. I'm so glad I went and searched her because I've nicked her. So that was... That went down well, though, with the bigger boys. They were like, that's amazing, you got nicked. I was like... <laughs> but so, that shouldn't have happened. That was an, an, an operational mm -hmm. error on their part. They should have checked. You're supposed to check to make sure there's nothing going on in that pub. They didn't check. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to raid it. But, it's good boy, yeah, But it was good for me. It was good for my legend, yeah. anyway. <laughs> See, when you do the undercover stuff, did you ever come face to face with the people you done after them to interview them? Or was it all just behind the screen then once you're you've got them, the conviction. Did you ever have to go and interview them or anything? Like no. The nonces or the paedophiles? I would literally, it, that I, I was just literally there as the asset to be deployed. So mm -hmm. there'd be a whole team, an investigations team that would deal with everything. How so, young a kid were you playing? How young would you go, try and look? Um, Is there a lot of makeup then behind 13, that? 13, 14. Is it depends. A, if it was face-to-face, -face, it's harder. If it's on a uh -huh. screen, it's not that drastic. But 13, 14. But I was 20s, mid-20s, and I'm short, so, mm -hmm. and I was skinny then as well. How many girls were in the undercover team? Uh, there was probably, I know two, mm, th four, but, yeah, probably four, but out of them four, probably one other was deployed, regular. She had a spe very specialist language skill. Um, so she was deployed, but not the others weren't really deployed. They said no to a lot of jobs. How were you treated with the other screws? Because obviously, 
there's at different levels and now who like army hate the navy and the juice does it everybody together or the armed response hate the undercover or like, was that people against Jews? No one knew who we were. Did so, they not? But do you know what is really, this is bad and my husband always mocks me for this, but when I, obviously I was uniform for a while and I'd st I still had a day job while I was doing the covert stuff. I was just never at my day job, but used to really give my, my bosses the ump because I'm showing on their team strength and I'm not there. Um, but because I was uniform, obviously you ingratiate yourself. And there's a place in Covent Garden called Roadhouse. It's a dump, absolute dump, but full of coppers. Everyone, every copper goes there. And I'm responsible always outside. And I used to come out and they'd go, all right, Dan. And I'd be like, all right, do you want a lift home? I'd be like, yeah. So you'd get a lift home with the arm response would just drive me home every night. And I've like, when I've seen them after, like now, not recently, but since I've left, they're like, I can't believe you've left. I can't believe you did all that. We had no idea. And Ben will be like, oh, they're the ones that used to give you the lift. <laughs> <laughs> did you have to wear a wire in every job? No, As only when you're comfortable. Because that's a bit sus, isn't it? Yeah, and it can go bent. Like, I've got a, a male colleague who had been infiltrating this particular gang for months, and then they said, are you comfortable with the wire? And he's like, yeah, no worries. And he went to this job, went to pick up, and there was a woman in there who was off her face, he was going, he's old Bill, he's a copper, he's a fed. And he was like, shut up. And the dealer was telling her to shut up. The dealer slapped her mm -hmm. and said, shut up. And she grabbed him. And his wife came out and they beat him up. Like proper done him. And he's a big lad. And I said, if that, if, when he came to them, we had a meeting about it all because obviously mm -hmm. it was pretty bad. When he came, he was mashed, proper mashed up. And I said, if that was me that had got that hide in, I'd be dead. Like he's a big lad. I wouldn't have been able to take that. Wait, see the, the entrapment, does that even exist anymore? Or is that a myth? Because yeah. I've asked something that, and I don't know if they ever gave us a kind of straight answer. Look, so if I'm an undercover cop and I'm buying gear or I'm snorting, can coppers snort gear and stuff with? No. Coppers have done that, but, haven't they? Some, you're not that. allowed, you're told not to, yeah. But, you're not allowed to like actually do it. You They say that you're supposed to have a good enough reason to not do it. That's part of your story and your legend. Why are you not doing it? Mm -hmm. And you've got to have a reason why you're not doing it. So... How does it work then, entrapment? What is that law? So it'd be, it's, it's called argent provocateur, where you make them do something they wouldn't ordinarily do. You say, is that good? Is that a French thing? It's, agent provo provocateur? Well, it? I thought it was underwear. Because <laughs> it's is an that, underwear brand. Uh -huh. A really expensive brand. I never knew what it was until obviously joining mm -hmm. this team. But you're not allowed to make them do something they wouldn't normally do. So if I went to a guy and said, as, especially as a woman, Oh, I need some gear. Can you get me? And he's like, Oh, I, I don't know. I can ask someone. That's not cool because he wouldn't. He obviously doesn't know, and he's not going to really be doing that normally. But because he fancies you, he'll go and get it for you. That's that's not okay. That's crap in it because he, he's not a drug dealer. He's mm -hmm. doing it because he thinks he's going to get a date out of you. Um, yeah, so it's still a thing, but. It's up to you to make sure that you're doing it properly and the evidence is secure and that it's not just happening because you're flirting with him. Or... Yeah. What's the worst thing you've seen that sticks in your mind that's mm. probably replays from time to time? It weren't on a covert job. It was actually uniform and it was a baby that had died. The parents had, the dad had killed the mum, hung himself and left the baby, the baby starved to death. That was... Not the best scene, no. Yeah. How do you deal with that? It's just my job. Now, though? You still get flashbacks? Not. I think about it, but I think about other stuff more than that. I think of things that make me feel guilty more. Um, like what? This guy, I, I talk about him all the time, actually, and he probably think he probably sees this and thinks, that fucking bitch. But I actually do feel genuinely bad. He did a bad thing. But I think it changed his entire life. And he, I was deployed at a festival in um, Kendall. And I was buying gear and pills and kit. But I'm at a festival. It's like 10 a penny. We were literally going into this dance tent and going, Who's, do you reckon's got gear? Everyone's chewing their own faces off. It's like, it's, it was literally like that one, that one. It was no specific, oh, this person, we think it's this person. It was literally... We think there's a bad batch of gear because it happens. And the, the, the intent of the operation was good because they, they thought there was a bad batch and they wanted to get it. But who's got it? 
We don't know. And this guy, this was a young guy, and I was watching him, and he served someone up. And I thought, oh, he's got gear. So I went over and had a chat with him. And he said, oh, yeah, it was Kent. And he was like, I've got it, but I ain't got enough here. Come back to my tent. So we were like, all right. So we went back to his tent, served us up. He obviously got nicked. And it went to court. And he was a law student. He was studying to be a lawyer. He was young. Not a scumbag. that You, you know, you think, oh, scumbags. He wasn't a scumbag. His dad was a lawyer. His dad was fuming at court, as you can imagine. But this kid, I don't, I don't believe for one second he was a drug dealer in the sense of he goes home and he's cutting up in his bedroom. I think he's bought himself some gear and he's just marked it up in the festival and pinging it out. And he's just got, he's literally just been unlucky and got caught. He went to prison. Lost his career. I what? think about him all the time. Hopefully he's not ended up on gear in there or beaten up or bullied and he's came out and he's made them stronger. You never know. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't I wouldn't even look look him up, but I don't think my, my presence would be welcome in yeah. his family. But I've got a daughter at 18 and I always like to think that, or I do not like to think, but I always think if she made one, t and it is a tiny, it's a matter of minutes, a mistake in a matter of minutes, how the li your life just flips on its head. Yeah. And I can't imagine his dad was not happy, not with just us, but not with the kid either. I can't imagine he, the dad, the phone call to the dad, and he's been nicked for possession with intent to supply. Yeah. But again, you're still doing your job as well. See, a lot, a lot of the like, petty criminals and like, shitey drug dealers that are doing their wee bits in festivals and stuff, like, they're doing, like, a lot of these kids, they think they're big ballers because they're selling a couple of gram here and there. Like, yeah. They're so small. Like, it's, but do they not realise the extent of undercovers that actually work in festivals? Because a lot of people, a lot of kids die in these festivals as well. Yeah, that's They'll be what taking their for, first yeah. pill and stuff. And I know that Street Valium have killed so many people as well. Like, yeah. Like, do you, obviously, they're not realising then how extreme it can be when kids lose their life, especially yeah. at a festival. They're excited trying their first pill, buying dead. But like, what happens then if, a kid give somebody a pill and they take it and they die. Who's what does he get charged with? Uh, there was that case recently, wasn't there, yeah. where it was actually an actor's daughter, mm -hmm. and he went he went to trial, but he got off with it. If I guess if they're taking it themselves, it's not murder then, is it? No, I would assume not. I don't know the ins and outs. Of yeah, what same. It was. I remember reading something about it, but it is scary, and, and people need to understand the damage and the effects it does but again everybody's got free will yeah. there's enough stories out there where you want listen I took drugs for years and all of a sudden I'm fucking I'm studying all the other shit that you put in your body and I'm just more aware I wasn't yeah. aware then it was just normal it was yeah. normal to go to festivals and get out your nut it was it was yeah. it, was, it just made sense that's what everybody done so I'm going to do it yeah it's you like know. going out on a Friday or on a Thursday night when we're growing up all, not all my friends that's not a fair statement mm -hmm. but our, some of my friends would do gear Thursday night in the city. Friday night, they would be back on it. Saturday night, Sunday would be a bad day. Monday would be a worse day. <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday would be pretty bad. Thursday would be brilliant again. Yeah, I've read it again. They would, they would just constantly live that, that cycle. And I used to watch them and think, like, well, the, one, the money. Like, how the hell are you affording that? Yeah. And the cycle of it. And... I don't. Th I think a lot of them still do it to this day. Yeah, we see a lot of people. A lot of people I grew up in their twenties. Everybody's fresh faced, so you could yeah. party for three, four days and still look the same. But I see the f effects of ninety percent of them now. Yeah, like in their thirties, struggling, problem, chronic pain. But I yeah. was blessed to have kind of awoken to it, which I'm still privileged. But it's just it's scary how far it goes. So see, when you left. Then what was the decision then to, to walk away? Like, was that a hard decision or was it easy because you'd seen so much? It was actually, um, so um, my partner at the time, Albert's dad, who was the UC, he wrote a book and that did not go down very well. They were He was the golden boy of that, that team. Like they thought he was the one. He spoke multiple languages fluently. He looked the part and... They were obviously a bit pissed that he left because who's going to do them jobs now? And he then wrote a book. And there was nothing in the book, like like mine, there's nothing in there with trade secrets. I would never do that in a million years. There's nothing in my book, there was nothing in his book that wasn't Googleable. And 
there was a few messages exchanged where they weren't happy. Obviously, they knew we were together, which they weren't. They didn't mind at the time when we were both serving, but the moment we one left, they weren't. They didn't really like that. Um, and I just thought, if I went back now, I don't think I'd be welcomed with well, like you know, big arms and oh, thank God you're back. I feel like I'd be a bit nerve. I'd be nervous and I wouldn't be looked after like I was. Um, and I started hearing again rumours about how they were all stabbing each other in the back. And I thought, I don't want to be a part of that. Because when I was there, we all, we all properly looked after each other. And, like, I don't know, it, was, it sounds so crap, but we were like a little family. And because of the stuff that we would all do and the work we would do, we stuck together. And then I started hearing these rumours and I thought, I don't want that. That's not what I know. Um, and some of the stories I heard I know are true and I know some that are far-fetched. I don't know the ins and outs of the war, obviously, but... I didn't want to be a part of that, so I left. Easy decision then? It was an easy decision, but I, I missed work, but it was an easy decision. Do you miss it still? Do you miss it now that you've kind of had time to reflect and kind of, because we all want something in my life. Listen, it's great being a mother, raising <laughs> kids and doing the right thing, but if you've been that life independent, doing your own thing, part of you feel like your own little boss, nobody knows, undercover, that it's, yeah. it's glamorous, that like, even... It sounds sexier than yeah, it is, Yeah, <laughs> but do you ever think that... Because I'm not classing it the same as it being a boxer, but boxers find it hard to retire yeah. because they're missing that sort of something. The right thing for the me... Pressure. Yeah. It's the pressure. You live under pressure yeah. and you miss the pressure. I'm quite old school. That for me, is to provide and protect. Like I'd prefer my missus to raise the kids and homeschool mm -hmm. and do learn and educate and be there. I don't think falling pregnant and then having to rush back to work. Some parents have to go straight back a week yeah. later after giving birth. Like, I feel as if the connection should be with the mum skin to skin and just mm. learning and growing and understanding. But you being doing that, like, that's the right thing to do is raise your son and, and be there yeah. a million percent. But do you ever think, fuck, like, my life's a wee bit dull now? It was <laughs> for about, a, maybe about two years, I thought, what am I going to do? I need something because this is not... I was living off my savings, which wasn't much. So it wasn't like even for the financial side of it. It was more just mental, like, what am I going to do? Um, and then my friend rang me, and she was actually a TP, so a test purchase officer. And she said, I've got this job. I think you would like it. You need to be at this place at this time. And I was like, what's the day rate? And she told me, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go. And I didn't realise it was an audition because that's not for me, like... I'll never be on telly in a million years. I've lived my whole life under the radar. Um, and I got there and I said to the lady, look, I've realised what this is um, after about 20 minutes because I still didn't get it when I got there. Um, I'm really sorry to waste your time. I'm not doing this. She, TV people are very nice, aren't they? And all, oh, but you'd be so great. Which that, no one talks to each other like that in the police. She was really nice. Twisted my arm. She manipulated me, actually. And said, just do a piece to camera. Like, just let me ask you some questions. See how you get on. We won't put it on TV. And I was like, as long as it's not going on TV. And she was like, it won't go on TV. I was like, okay. So we did it. And then I got another phone call from her saying, can you come and video, uh, film the pilot? We really like the video. Um, can you just come and do the pilot? I said, is that going on TV? No, 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 it's not going on TV. I was like, all right, I'll do it, but I'm not going on TV. So she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously the pilot was really successful. Channel 4 would like you to come and... I said, no, I can't do that. I just can't do it. I said, who else is doing it? And then she told me some names. I was like, like Black, Peter Black. I'm like, why is he doing it? Like, I know of, like, he wasn't in the unit when I was in the unit, but everyone used to talk about him still. I said, like, why is he doing it? He shouldn't be doing it. And then they like, told us some names of other people and who they were, where their backgrounds. And I was like, well, if they're doing it, I can do it. So I did hunted. And then that gave me my fix for a little bit. But my day job now, still, we still do quite a lot of physical surveillance at our company and I'll, I won't give it to anyone else. Me and Ben go and do it ourselves because we still need our fix of mm. covert surveillance. So we, we go out and do it. And we, we've just finished a job actually in another country and I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I really want to talk about it. And when I'm allowed to, I'll talk about yeah, it from me. the rooftops. But um, we basically caught someone who was wanted. Um, it was amazing actually. We got him and our daughter was the translator for it because we don't speak the language, but she's, she's trilingual. She, and the, the information that she received 
um, what led to this person's capture. It was amazing. So that gave us our fix. So we still do stuff like that because um, we're losers. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it then, like the cyber stuff that you're all doing now, like touch on that, like all the mad stuff. Like, so see that job they talk about, is that mm. like... Uh, I wouldn't say secret, but is that private? Yeah, it was. It was funded privately to just from normal people or from your side of things. It was uh, private and funded by our services privately, but in co in collaboration with a law enforcement agency. So that happens then. That it's not it doesn't have to actually just be working for the police force. We can go. Yeah. Somebody old school who knows the job. Listen, we've got a job for you. That. As legit, yeah, like some James Bond shit. Like it was, yeah, it was really good. Oh, yeah, you need to tell <laughs> it us. was really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, they're like, you can't say anything yet. I'm like, mm -hmm. do come you, on. Do you find it easier doing that with not the added pressure of doing it? If it was private, do you still get paid if you don't catch anybody? Yeah, I still get paid, but the pressure's higher because now we're not. We don't have the protection. We don't have it. We don't. We can't walk in somewhere and ask for it. If someone says they're not going to talk to us, they can tell us to go, and that's it. We don't have a warrant card anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to just rely on them. We have to ingratiate ourselves with them and rely on them telling us stuff. Um, so how does that work with you? Like, if you've not got the protection, like, could you get in trouble if pushing the boundaries too much? Because you are, is it still associated with the old job that you've still got enough room to push, raise the bar? Is that a tricky one? Um, yeah, we're not allowed to push the boundaries. Mm -hmm. So obviously we write, make sure we write. We we do do it all still proper old school. We write everything up because you just never know, do you? And we still write. I still, Ben thinks I'm a proper sado, but I'm like, I need to do a statement. And he's like, what? I'm like, we need to write a statement because we did just go in there. And I want to write that we've been in there at this time, that day. This is who we spoke to. Because it, you just never know, do you? So let's just write the statement. And he's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I make him write the statement, but... We do quite a lot of stuff like that, so they, especially surveillance stuff, because we just can't let it go. Has anybody ever came forward and said, you nick me, a bastard? Like, no, but I do always... Why like, is that? I don't know, but people always say, are you not worried? And I'm like, look, if these people wanted to find me, they would have found me by now. Like, I can't live under this rock forever, and we live online like they really could find me they could have found me 10 years ago yeah um anybody can be got and it's not yeah. as if people are going to go and commit more crimes because they know how dangerous you can be so do you think they're going to really put themselves forward to, and do what yeah do you know what i mean like the times i get to jail back in the day i've not got in my mind that i'm going to go after the people who jail me you're done wrong yeah fuck's sake it's a it's funny but people always ask that they're like but you must be a bit nervous and i'm like I mean, I, when I, I, I've always been like this anyway. My friends, it really annoys my friends. If we go out for dinner or to a bar and there's not a seat where I can have like prime position where I can see everything that's going on, I'll say, let's go somewhere else. Because I like to sit in the corner of my back so I can see everything that's going on. And they say, when they talk to me, I'm never looking at them. I'm like that, like scanning. But it's just a natural thing to do. And Ben does it. And sometimes I'll, like, we'll argue who has the seat. I'm like, no, I don't want it because I want it. We're like, just sit next to each other. <laughs> so you're not always on edge, but you're always aware of what's going aware. on. Yeah, you've always got to be aware anyway. Yeah, especially, I always, especially in London, man. Yeah. Like, I'm always on my toes. I don't care where I am, and I'm not a copper. I'm not been and seen a lot of the dark stuff that you've seen. But I'm always listening. I'm, I'm always got to be on top of things. I'll yeah. always be calm. I'll always walk my head held tight. But I still, I'll fucking stuss. I'll scan that place. Yeah. Every event I go to, I'll still scan it. People are drunk. People just know what's going exactly. to happen. And I, and I see, I'm ten steps ahead. Of a lot of people in these places where I'm always, I just know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just know. The book then. How was it writing it? Were you nervous? Very. Why? I wasn't gonna. Everyone used to say you should write a book. You should write a book. And there's loads of male ones like. UC book but it's Jordan again Jordan Wiley we sat in the we'd be sat in the car filming Hunted and we, he'd talk to me about stuff he's done and obviously he's written a book, few books and then he would ask me questions and, we, and he was like you need to write a book I said I'm not writing a book and he kept going on and on and on and then I said oh I'll speak to someone I'll see no I didn't and then someone messaged me and said have you ever considered writing a book and then they introduced me to um, an agent and he's really lovely. He's really, really well spoken and lovely and older than like us. And he then put me, he said, Can you write it yourself? I was like, I can't even speak English, let alone write a book. 
And he said, okay, I can put you in touch with a ghostwriter. And she's fantastic. And we wrote a book. Here we are. But I can't, I just think it's madness. And Where can people buy your book? Um, Amazon have it. All the books like Waterstones all have it. Um, mm. There's loads on, of uh, independent websites online that have it that I didn't know either. Apparently you can buy it in other languages. Which is, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. But it's a fascinating story. And like I say, being on here today and just being, listen, this is me, this is what I've done. Like, it's fascinating. Like, that is intriguing. Like, these will do well. Undercover ones always do well. Yeah. But you're a good person, man. I thoroughly enjoyed this chat. Like, you're Thank genuinely you. a decent person. Like, just before we finish up, for anybody that's maybe in the struggle or seen some dark stuff that they can't really get over, like, what advice would you have for them? Speak to someone. Yeah, don't bottle it up. I think, I think I'm really fortunate. The stuff that makes me worry now and like I said to you about that young lad that I think about all the time if I didn't talk about that it would eat me up inside so I do think talking and it sounds really cliche but talking to people mm -hmm. um and people do want to listen like people do want to listen I've got friends that struggle have struggled and they'll talk to me about stuff and I'm the world's worst I'll give out all this inf advice and then not take it myself but talk just talk yeah it's important Danny listen absolutely enjoyed that Thank I wish you, you nothing but the best for the Thank future you. stay happy stay strong <laughs> and stay out of trouble I'll try yeah God bless. <laughs>